Art and Ritual by Jane Ellen Harrison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The title of this book may strike the reader as a strange and even dissonant. What have art and ritual to do together? The ritualist is, to the modern mind, a man concerned perhaps unduly with fixed forms and ceremonies with carrying out the rigidly prescribed ordinances of a church or sect. The artist, on the other hand, we think of as free in thought and untrammeled by convention and practice. His tendency is towards license. Art and ritual is quite true, have diverged today, but the title of this book is chosen advisedly. Its object is to show that these two divergent developments have a common root, and that neither can be understood without the other. It is at the outset one and the same impulse that sends a man to church and to the theatre such a statement may sound today paradoxical even irreverent but to the greek of the sixth fifth and even fourth century b c it would have been a simple truism we shall see this best by following an athenian to his theatre on the day of the great spring festival of dionysos passing through the entrance gate to the theatre on the south side of the acropolis or athenian citizen will find himself at once on holy ground he is within a temenos or precinct a place cut off from the common land and dedicated to a god he will pass to the left two temples standing near to each other one of earlier the other of later date for a temple once built was so sacred that it would only be reluctantly destroyed as he enters the actual theatre he will pay nothing for his seat his attendance is an act of worship, and from the social point of view, obligatory. The entrance fee is therefore paid for him by the state. The theatre is open to all Athenian citizens, but the ordinary man will not venture to seat himself in the front row. In the front row, and that only, the seats have backs, and the central seat of this row is an armchair. The whole of the front row is permanently reserved, not for individual rich men who can afford to hire boxes, but for certain state officials, and these officials are all priests. On each seat the name of the owner is inscribed. The central seat is of the priest of Dionysos Eleutherius, the god of the precinct. Near him is the seat of the priest of Apollo, the laurel bearer, and again of the priest of the Asclepios, and of the priest of Olympian Zeus, and so on round the whole front semicircle it is as though at his majesty's the front row of stalls was occupied by the whole bench of bishops with the archbishop of canterbury enthroned in the central stall the theatre at athens is not open night by night nor even day by day dramatic performances take place only at certain high festivals of dionysos in winter and spring it is again as though the modern theatre was open only at the festivals of the epiphany and of easter our modern at least our protestant custom is in direct contrast we tend on great religious festivals rather to close than to open our theatres another point of contrast is in the time allotted to the performance we give to the theatre our after-dinner hours when work is done or at best a couple of hours in the afternoon the theater is for us a recreation. The Greek theater opened at sunrise, and the whole day was concentrated to high and strenuous religious attention. During the five or six days of the great Dioncia, the whole city was in a state of unwanted sanctity under a taboo. To distrain a debtor was illegal. Any personal assault, however trifling, was sacrilege most impressive and convincing of all is the ceremony that took place on the eve of the performance by torchlight accompanied by a great procession the image of the god dionysus himself has brought to the theatre and placed in the orchestra moreover he came not only in human but in animal form chosen young men of the athenians in the flower of their youth and Phoebe, escorted to the precinct a splendid bull it was expressively ordained that the bull should be worthy of the god he was, in fact, as we shall presently see, the primitive incarnation of the god. It is again as though in our modern theatre there stood, sanctifying all things to our use, 
and us to his service the human figure of the saviour and beside him the paschal lamb but now we come to a strange thing a god presides over the theatre to go to the theatre is an act of worship to the god dionysus and yet when the play begins three times out of four of dionysus we hear nothing we see it may be agamemnon returning from troy clemtenestra waiting to slay him the vengeance of orestes the love of phaedra for hippolytos the hate of medea and the slaying of her children stories beautiful tragic morally instructive it may be but scarcely we feel religious the orthodox greeks themselves sometimes complained that in the plays enacted before them there was nothing to do with dionysos if drama be at the outset divine with its roots in ritual why does it issue in an art profoundly solemn tragic yet purely human the actors wear ritual vestments like those of the celebrants at the eleusinian mysteries why then do we find them not executing a religious service or even a drama of gods and goddesses but rather impersonating mere homeric heroes and heroines greek drama which seemed at first to give us our clue to show us a real link between ritual and art breaks down betrays us it would seem just at the crucial moment and leaves us with our problem on our hands had we only greek ritual and art we might well despair the greeks are a people of such swift constructive imagination that they almost always obscure any problem of origins so fair and magical are their cloud-capped towers that they distract our minds from the task of digging for foundations there is scarcely a problem in the origins of greek mythology and religion that has been solved within the domain of greek thinking only ritual with them was in the case of drama so swiftly and completely transmuted into art that had we had greek material only to hand we might never have marked the transition happily however we are not confined within the greek paradise wider fields are open to us our subject is not only greek but ancient art and ritual we can turn at once to the egyptians a people slower witted than the greeks and watch their sluggish but more instructive operations to one who is studying the development of the human mind the average or even stupid child is often more illuminating than the abnormally brilliant greece is often too near to us too advanced too modern to be for comparative purposes instructive of all egyptian perhaps of all ancient deities no god has lived so long or had so wide and deep an influence in osiris he stands as the prototype of the great class of resurrection gods who die that they may live again his sufferings his death and his resurrection were enacted year by year in a great mystery play at abydos in that mystery play was set forth first what the greeks call his agon his contest with his enemy set then his pathos his suffering or downfall and defeat his wounding his death and his burial finally his resurrection and recognition his anagnorisis either as himself or as his only begotten son horus now the meaning of his thrice told tale we shall consider later for the moment we are concerned only with the fact that it is set forth both in art and ritual at the festival of orsiris small images of the god were made of sand and vegetable earth his cheekbones were painted green and his face yellow the images were cast in a mould of pure gold representing the god as a mummy after sunset on the twenty-fourth day of the month shioak the effigy of orsiris was laid in a grave and the image of the previous year was removed the intent of all this was made transparently clear by other rites at the beginning of the festival there was a ceremony of ploughing and sowing one end of the field was sown with barley the other with spelt another part with flax while this was going on the chief priest recited the ritual of the sowing of the fields into the garden of the god which seems to have been a large pot were put sand and barley then fresh living water from the immudation of the nile was poured out of a golden vase over the garden and the barley was allowed to grow up it was a symbol of the resurrection of the god after his burial 
for the growth of the garden is the growth of the divine substance. The death and resurrection of the gods and paripasu of the life and fruits of the earth was thus set forth in ritual, but, and this is our immediate point, it was also set forth in definite unmistakable art. In the great temple of Isis at Philae, there is a chamber dedicated to Osiris. Here is represented the dead Osiris out of his body, sprung ears of corn, and a priest waters the growing stalk from a picture. The inscription to the picture reads, This is the form of him who one may not name, Osiris of the Mysteries, who springs from the returning waters. It is but another presentation of the ritual of the month Shioak, in which effigies of the god made of earth and corn were buried. When these effigies were taken up, it would be found that the corn had sprouted actually from the body of the god, and this sprouting of the grain would, as Dr. Fraser says, be hailed as an omen, or rather as the cause of the growth of the crops. Even more vividly is the resurrection set forth in the bas reliefs that accompany the great Osiris, inscription at Dendera. Here the god is represented at first as a mummy, swathed and lying flat on his bier. Bit by bit he is seen, raising himself up in a series of gymnastically impossible positions, till at last he rises from a bowl, perhaps his garden, all but erect, between the outspread wings of Isis, while before him a male figure holds the crux ensada, the cross with the handle, the Egyptian symbol of life in ritual, the thing desired, the resurrection is acted in art, it is represented. No one will refuse to these bas reliefs the title of art. In Egypt, then, we have clearly an instance, only one out of many, where art and ritual go hand in hand, countless bas reliefs that decorate Egyptian tombs and temples are but ritual practices translated into stone. This, as we shall later see, is an important step in our argument. Ancient art and ritual are not only closely connected, not only do they mutually explain and illustrate each other, but as we shall presently find, they actually arise out of a common human impulse. The god who died and rose again is not, of course, confined to Egypt. He is worldwide. When Ezekiel came to the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, he beheld there the woman weeping for Tammuz, this abomination the house of Judah had brought with them from Babylon. Tammuz is Demuzi, the true son, or more fully, Demuzi Abzu, true son of the waters. He too, like Osiris, is a god of the life that springs from inundation, and that dies down in the heat of the summer, in Milton's procession of false gods. Thamuz came next behind, whose annual wound in Lebanon allured the Syrian damsels to lament his fate in amorous ditties all a summer's day. Thamuz in Babylon was the young love of Ashtar. Each year he died and passed below the earth to the place of dust and death, the land from which there is no returning, the house of darkness, where dust lies on door and bolt. And the goddess went after him, and while she was below, life seized in the earth, no flower blossomed, and no child of animal or man was born. We know Tammuz, the true son, best by one of his titles. Adonis, the lord or king, the rites of Adonis, were celebrated at midsummer. That is certain and memorable, for just as the Athenian feet was setting sail on its ill-almond voyage to Syracuse, the streets of Athens were thronged with funeral processions. Everywhere was seen the image of the dead god, and the air was full of the lamentations of weeping woman. Thucydides does not so much as mention the coincidence, but Plutarch tells us those who took account of omens were full of concern for the fate of their countrymen. To start an expedition on the day of the funeral rites of Adonis, the Catanish Lord was no luckier than to set sail on a Friday, the death day of the Lord of Christendom. The rites of Tammuz and of Adonis, celebrated in the summer, were rites of death rather than of resurrection. The emphasis is on the fading and dying down of vegetation rather than on its upspringing. The reason of this is simple and will soon become manifest, for the moment we have only to note 
that while in Egypt the rites of Osiris are represented as much by art as by ritual, in Babylon and Palestine, in the Feast of Tammuz, and Adonis, it is ritual rather than art that obtains. We have now to pass to another inquiry. We have seen that art and ritual, not only in Greece but in Egypt and Palestine, are closely linked. So closely, indeed, they are linked that we even begin to suspect they may have a common origin. We have now to ask, what is it that links art and ritual so closely together? What have they in common? Do they start from the same impulse, and if so, why do they, as they develop, fall so widely asunder? It will clear the air if we consider for a moment what we mean by art, and also in somewhat greater detail what we mean by ritual. Art Plateau tells us, in a famous passage of the Republic, its imitation. The artist imitates natural objects, which are themselves in its philosophy, but copies of higher realities. All the artist can do is to make a copy of a copy to hold up in a mirror to nature, in which, as he turns it, whether he will are reflected sun and heavens and earth and man anything and everything never did a statement so false so wrong-headed contain so much suggestion of truth truth which by the help of analyzing ritual we may perhaps be able to disentangle but first his falsehood must be grasped and this is the more important as plateau's misconception in modified form lives on today a painter not long ago thus defined his own art the art of painting is the art of imitating solid objects upon a flat surface by means of pigments. A sorry life work, few people today, perhaps, regard art as the close and realistic copy of nature. Photography has at least scotched, if not slain, that error, but many people still regard art as a sort of improvement, honor and idealization of nature. It is the part of the artist, they think, to take suggestions and materials from nature and from these to build up, as it were, a revised version, it is perhaps only by studying those rudimentary forms of art that are closely akin to ritual that we come to see how utterly wrong-headed is this conception. Take the representations of Osiris that we have just described, the mummy rising bit by bit from his beer. Can anyone maintain that art is here a copy or imitation of reality? However realistic the painting, it represents a thing imagined, not actual. There never was any such person as Osiris, and if there had been, he would certainly never, once mummified, have risen from his tomb. There is no question of fact, and the copy of fact in the matter, moreover, had there been. Why should anyone desire to make a copy of natural fact? The whole imitation theory, to which and to the element of truth it contains, we shall later have occasion to return heirs. In fact, though supplying no adequate motive for a widespread human energy, it is probably this lack of motive that has led other theorizers to adopt the view that art is idealization. Man with pardonable optimism desires, it is thought, to improve on nature modern science confronted with a problem like that of the rise of art no longer casts about to conjecture how art might have arisen she examines how it actually did arise abundant material has now been collected from among savage peoples of an art so primitive that we hesitate to call it art at all and it is in these incoherent efforts that we are able to track the secret motive springs that move the artist now and then among the Hukal Indians, if the people fear a drought from the extreme heat of the sun, they take a clay disc, and on one side of it they paint the face of Father Sun, a circular space surrounded by rays of red and blue and yellow, which are called his arrows. For the Hukal Sun, like Phoebus Apollo, has arrows for rays. On the reverse side they will paint the progress of the sun through the four quarters of the sky, the journey is symbolized by a large cross-like figure with a central circle for midday. Round the edge are beehive-shaped mounds. These represent the hills of earth. The red and yellow dots that surround the hills are cornfields. The crosses on the hills are signs of wealth and money. On some of the discs, birds and scorpions are painted, and on one are curving lines. 
which mean rain. These discs are deposited on the altar of the godhouse and left, and then all is well. The intention might be to us obscure, but a who call Indian would read it thus. Father Son with his broad shield, or face, and his arrows, rises in the east, bringing money and wealth to the who he calls. His heat and the face from his rays make the corn to grow, but he is asked not to interfere with the clouds that are gathering on the hills. Now is this art or ritual? It is both and neither. We distinguish between a form of prayer and a work of art, and count them in no danger of confusion. But the huacal goes back to that earlier thing, a presentation. He utters, expresses his thought about the sun, and his emotion about the sun, and his relation to the sun. And if prayer is the soul's sincere desire, he has painted a prayer. It is not a little curious that the same notion comes out in the old Greek word for prayer, uache, the Greek, when he wanted help in trouble from the saviors, the Descuri carved a picture of them, and if he was a sailor, added a ship. Underneath, he inscribed the word Iuche. It was not to begin with a vow paid. It was a presentation of his strong inner desire. It was a sculptured prayer. Ritual then involves imitation, but does not arise out of it. It desires to recreate an emotion, not to produce an object. A right is, indeed, we shall later see. A sort of stereotyped action, not really practical, but yet not wholly cut loose from practice, a reminiscence or an anticipation of actual practical doing, it is fitly, though not quite correctly, called by the Greeks a dromenion, a thing done. At the bottom of art, it is motive power, and its mainspring lies not the wish to copy nature or even improve on her. The who we call Indian does not vainly expend its energies on an effort so fruitless, but rather an impulse shared by art with ritual, the desire that is to utter, to give out a strongly felt emotion or desire by representing, by making or doing or enriching the object or act desired. The common source of that art and ritual of Osiris is the intense, worldwide desire that the life of nature which seemed dead should live again. This common emotional factor it is that makes art and ritual in their beginnings well nigh indistinguishable, both to begin with, copy and act, but not at first for the sake of the copy. Only when the emotion dies down and is forgotten does the copy become an end in itself a mere mimicry. It is this downward path, the sinking of making to mimicry, that makes us nowadays think of ritual as a dull and formal thing. Because a right has ceased to be believed in, it does not in the least follow that it will cease to be done. We have to reckon with all the huge forces of habit. The motor nerves, once set in one direction, given the slightest impulse, tend always to repeat the same reaction. We mimic not only others but ourselves mechanically. Even after all emotion proper to the act is dead, and then because mimicry has a certain ingenuous charm, it becomes an end in itself for ritual, even for art. It is not easy, as we saw, to classify the huacal prayer discs. As prayers, they are ritual. As surface decorated, they are decorated. They are specimens of primitive art. In the next chapter, we shall have to consider a kind of ceremony very instructive for our point, but again not very easy to classify the pantomic dances, which are almost all over the world so striking a feature in savage social and religious life are they to be classed as ritual or art these pantomime dances lie indeed as the very heart and root of our whole subject and it is of the first importance that before going further in our analysis of art and ritual we should have some familiarity with their general character and geist the more so as they are a class of ceremonies now practically extinct we shall find in these dances the meeting point between art and ritual, or rather we shall find them in the rude, in choy material, out of which both ritual and art, at least in one of its forms, developed. Moreover, we shall find in panatomic dancing a ritual bridge, as it were, between actual life and those representations of life which we call art. In our next chapter, therefore, we shall study the ritual dance in general and try to understand its psychological origin. In the following chapter, we shall take a particular dance of special importance. 
the spring dance as practiced among various primitive peoples we shall then be prepared to approach the study of the spring dance among the greeks which developed into their drama and thereby too we hope throw light on the relation between ritual and art end of art and ritual the art of leaving off by henry van dyke this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Bill Mosley It was a hot August Sunday, one of those days on which art itself must not be made too long, lest it should shorten life. A little company of us had driven down from our hotel on the comparatively breezy hill to attend church in the village. The majority chose to pay their devotions at the big yellow meeting-house, where the preacher was reputed a man of eloquence. But my uncle Peter drew me with him to the modest gray chapel at the far end of the street, which was temporarily under the care of a student in the winter school of theology, who was wisely spending his vacation in the summer school of life. Some happy inspiration led the young man to select one of Lyman Abbott's shortest and simplest sermons, itself a type of the mercy which it commended, and frankly read it to us instead of pronouncing a discourse of his own. The result of this was that we came out of chapel at a quarter past eleven in a truly grateful and religious frame of mind but our comrades were still detained in the yellow meeting-house, and while the stage-coach waited for them in the glaring fervor of noon, my uncle Peter and I climbed down from our seats and took refuge on the grass, in the shadow of the round-head maples that stood guard along the north wall of the Puritan sanctuary. The windows were open. We could see the rhythmic motion of the fan-drill in the pews. The pulpit, was not visible, but from that unseen eminence a strident, persistent voice flowed steadily, expounding the necessity and uses of a baptism of fire, with a monotonous variety of application. Fire was needful for the young, for the middle-aged, for the old, and for those, if any, who occupied the intermediate positions. It was needful for the rich and for the poor, for the ignorant and for the learned, for church members, for those who were well-wishers but not professors, and for hardened sinners, for everybody, in fact, and if any case or condition of human creatures were omitted in the exhaustive analysis, the preacher led us to apprehend that he was only holding them in reserve and that presently he would include them in the warm and triumphant application of his subject. He was one of those preachers who say it all, and make no demands on the intelligence of their hearers. Meantime, the brown and yellow grasshoppers crackled over the parched fields, and the locusts rasped their one-stringed fiddles on the trees, and the shrunken little river complained faintly in its bed, and all nature was sighing, not for fire, but for water and cool shade. But still the ardent voice continued its fuliginous exhortations, until the very fans grew limp, and the flowers in the hats of the village girls seemed to wilt with fervent heat. My uncle Peter and I were brought up in that old-fashioned school of manners which discouraged the audible criticism of religious exercises. But we could not help thinking. He has just passed secondly, said I, and that leaves two more main heads and a practical conclusion of either three or five points. My uncle Peter said nothing in answer to this. After a while he remarked in an abstract, disconnected way, 
I wonder why no school of divinity has ever established a professorship of the art of leaving off. The thing is too simple, I replied. Theological seminaries do not concern themselves with the simplicities. And yet, said he, the simplest things are often the most difficult, and always the most important. The proverb says that well begun is half done, but the other half is harder and more necessary to get a thing well ended. It is the final word that is most effective, and it is something quite different from the last word. Many a talker, in the heat of his discussion and his anxiety to have the last word, runs clear past the final word and never gets back to it again. Talking, said I, is only a small part of life, and not of much consequence. I don't agree with you, he answered. The tongue is but a little member, yet behold how great a fire it kindles. Talking, rightly considered, is the expression and epitome of life itself. All the other arts are but varieties of talking, and in this matter of the importance of the final touch, the point at which one leaves off, talking is just a symbol of everything else that we do. It is the last step that costs, says the proverb, and I would like to add, it is the last step that counts. Be concrete, I begged. I like you best that way. Well, he continued, take the small art of making artificial flies for fishing. The knot that is hardest to tie is that which finishes off the confection, and binds the feathers and the silks securely to the hook, gathering up the loose ends and concealing them with invisible firmness. I remember when I first began to tie flies. I never could arrive at this final knot, but kept on and on, winding the thread around the hook and making another half-hitch to fasten the ones that were already made until the alleged fly looked like a young ostrich with a sore throat. Or take the art of sailing a boat. You remember Fanny Adair? She had a sublime confidence in herself that amounted to the first half of genius. She observed that, given a wind and a sail and a rudder, any person of common sense could make a boat move along. So she invited a small party of equally inexperienced friends to go out with her in a cat boat on Newport Harbor. The wind was blowing freshly and steadily towards the wharf, and neither the boatkeeper nor I suspected any lack in Fanny's competence as she boldly grasped the tiller and started out in fine style beating merrily to and fro across the bay. I went up town and came back at the appointed hour of six o'clock to meet the party. The wind was still blowing freshly and steadily straight into the wharf, but they had not returned. They were beating up and down, now skimming near to the landing, now darting away from it. We called them to come in. I saw a look of desperation settle on Fanny's face. She slacked away the main sheet, put the boat before the wind, held the tiller straight, and ran down upon the wharf with a crash that cracked the mast and tumbled the passengers over like ten pins in a strike. I knew I could sail the old thing, said Fanny, but I didn't think it would be so hard to stop her. I see what you mean, said I. Isn't the same difficulty often experienced by after-dinner speakers and lecturers and speculators on the stock market and moral reformers and academic coordinators of the social system of the universe? It is, he answered. They can sail the sea of theory splendidly, but they don't know how to make a landing. Yet that is really the thing that everybody ought to learn. No voyage is successful unless you deliver the goods. Even in a pleasure voyage, there must be a fit time and place for leaving off. 
there is a psychological moment at which the song has made its most thrilling impression and there the music should cease there is an instant of persuasion at which the argument has had its force and there it should break off just when the nail is driven home and before the hammer begins to bruise the wood the art lies in discovering this moment of cessation and using it to the best advantage this is the fascination of the real short story as told by hawthorne or poe or stevenson or cable or de maupassant or miss jewett or margaret deland it reaches the point of interest and stops the impression is not blurred it is like a well-cut seal small but clear and sharp you take the imprint of it distinctly stockton's story of the lady or the tiger would not gain anything by an addition on the natural history of tigers or the psychological peculiarities of ladies that is what is meant by the saying that brevity is the soul of wit the thing that keeps it alive a good joke prolonged degenerates into teasing and a merry jest with explanations becomes funereal when a man repeats the point of his story it is already broken off somebody said of mr gladstone's oratory that it was good but copious canaries sing well but the defect of their music is its abundance i prefer the hermit thrush to the nightingale not because the thrush's notes are sweeter but because he knows when to leave off and let his song vanish at the exquisite moment into the silence of mysterious twilight you seem to be proving i said what most men will admit without argument that enough is as good as a feast on the contrary he replied i am arguing against that proverb enough is not as good as a feast it is far better there is something magical and satisfying in the art of leaving off good advice is infinitely more potent when it is brief and earnest than when it dribbles into vague exhortations many a man has been worried into vice by well-meant but wearisome admonitions to be virtuous a single word of true friendly warning or encouragement is more eloquent than volumes of nagging pertinacity and may safely be spoken and left to do its work after all when we are anxious to help a friend into the right path there is not much more or better than we can say than what sir walter scott said when he was a dying to his son-in-law lockhart be a good man my dear be a good man the life must say the rest you are talking as seriously said i as if you were a preacher and we were in a church are we not said he very quietly when we are thinking and talking of the real meaning of life it seems to me that we are in the temple let me go on a moment longer in my talk we often fancy in this world that beautiful and pleasant things would satisfy us better if they could be continued without change forever we regret the ending of a good day off we are sorry to be coming out of the woods instead of going in and that regret is perfectly natural and all right it is part of the condition on which we receive our happiness the mistake lies in wishing to escape from it by a petrification of our joys the stone forest in arizona will never decay but it is no place for a man to set up his tents forever the other day a friend was admiring the old-fashioned house where i live tis a good camp said i plenty of wood and water 
and I hope it's on the right trail. Many of our best friends have gone ahead of us on that trail. Why should we hold back? The fairest things in the world and the finest are always in transition. The bloom of tender spring disappearing in the dark verdure of summer. The weak of meadow rue and nodding lilies passing as silently as it came. The splendid hues of the autumnal hills fading like the colors on a bubble. The dear child whose innocence and simplicity are a daily joy to you, growing up into a woman. Would you keep her a child forever, her head always a little lower than your heart? Would you stand where you are today, always doing the same things, always repeating the same experiences, never leaving off? then be thankful that the wisdom and goodness by which this passing show is ordered will not suffer you to indulge your foolish wish. The wisest men and women are not those who cling tenaciously to one point of life, with desperate aversion to all change, but those who travel cheerfully through its mutations, finding in every season, in every duty, in every pleasure, a time to begin and a time to cease, and moving on with willing adaptation through the conclusion of each chapter to the end of the book. And concerning that fini of the volume, which is printed in such sober, black, italic type, I remember a good saying of old Michel de Montaigne in one of his essays, not the exact words, but the soul of his remarks. He says that we cannot judge whether a man has been truly fortunate in life until we have seen him act with tranquility and contentment in the last scene of his comedy, which is undoubtedly the most difficult. For himself, he adds, his chief study and desire is that he may well behave himself at his last gasp, that is, quietly and constantly. It is a good saying, for life has no finer lesson to teach us than how to leave off. I wish you would promise me one thing, said I to my Uncle Peter, that you will not leave off before I do. Ah, he answered, that is the one thing that no man can promise another. We can promise not to break friendship, not to cut loose, not to cease loving, not to forget. Isn't that enough? He stood up reverently and bared his head. The music of the long meter doxology was floating through the open windows. Listen, he said. If that is true, what more do we need? We are all in his hand. End of The Art of Leaving Off by Henry Van Dyke Recording by Bill Mosley Frelsburg, Texas, USA Bermudas this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Bermudas from the Encyclopedia Britannica of 1910. Bermudas, a group of islands in the Atlantic Ocean, forming a British colony in 32 degrees something north 64 degrees 50 something west about 580 miles east by south from cape hatteras on the american coast the group consisting of small islands and reefs which mark the extreme northern range of the coral building polyps is of oval form measuring 22 miles from northeast to southwest 
the area being twenty square miles. The largest of the islands is Great Bermuda, or the main island, fourteen miles long and about a mile in average width, enclosing on the East Harrington or Little Sound, and on the west the Great Sound, which is thickly studded with islets, and protected on the north by the islands of Watford, Boaz, Ireland, and Somerset. The remaining members of the group, St. George, Paget, Smith, St. David, Cooper, Nonsuch, etc., lie northeast of the main island, and form a semicircle round Castle Harbour. The fringing islands which encircle the islands, especially on the north and west, leave a few deep passages wide enough to admit the largest vessels. Geology the Bermudas consist of Aeolian limestones, cf. Bahamas, which in some of the larger islands form irregular hills attaining a height of some 200 to 250 feet. These limestones are composed chiefly of comminuted shells drifted and deposited by the wind, and they are very irregularly stratified, as is usually the case with wind-blown deposits. Where fresh, the rock is soft, but where it has been exposed to the action of the sea, it is covered by a hard crust, and often loses all trace of stratification. The surface is frequently irregularly honeycombed. Even the reefs are not wholly formed of coral. They are ridges of aeolian limestone plastered over by a thin layer of corals and other calcareous organisms. The very remarkable serpuline atolls are covered by a solid crust made of the convoluted tubes of serpulae and vermetus, together with barnacles, mussels, nullipores, corallines, and some true encrusting corals. They probably rest upon a foundation of aeolian rock. The Bermudas were formerly much more extensive than at present, and they may possibly stand upon the summit of a hidden volcano. There are evidences of small oscillations of levels, but no proofs of great elevation or depression. Soil, climate, etc. The surface soil is a curious kind of red earth, which is also found in ochre-like strata throughout the limestone. It is generally mixed with vegetable matter and coral sand. There is a total want of streams and wells of fresh water, and the inhabitants are dependent on the rain which they collect and preserve in tanks. The climate is mild and healthy, although serious epidemics of yellow fever and typhus have occurred. The maximum reading of the thermometer is about 87 degrees Fahrenheit, and its minimum 49 degrees, the mean annual temperature being 70 degrees. The islands attract a large number of visitors annually from America. Vegetation is very rapid, and the soil is clad in a mantle of almost perpetual green. The principal kind of tree is the so-called Bermudas cedar, really a species of juniper, which furnishes timber for small vessels. The shores are fringed with the mangrove. The prickly pear grows luxuriantly in most barren districts, and wherever the ground is left to itself, the sagebrush springs up profusely. The citron, sour orange, lemon, and lime grow wild, but the apple and peach do not come to perfection. The loquat, an introduction from China, thrives admirably. The mild climate assists the growth of esculent plants and roots, and a considerable trade is carried on with New York, principally in onions, early potatoes, tomatoes, and beetroot, together with lily bulbs, cut flowers, and some arrowroot. Medicinal plants, as the castor oil plant and aloe, come to perfection without culture, and coffee, indigo, cotton, and tobacco are also of spontaneous growth. Few oxen or sheep are reared in the colony, meat, as well as bread and most vegetables, being imported from America. The indigenous mammals are very few, and the only reptiles are a small lizard and the green turtle. Birds, however, especially aquatic species, are very numerous. Insects are comparatively few, but ants swarm destructively in the heat of the year. Fish are plentiful round the coast, 
and the whale fishery was once an important industry but the fisheries as a whole have not been developed towns and administration there are two towns in the bermudas st george on the island of that name founded in seventeen ninety four and incorporated in seventeen ninety seven and hamilton on the main island founded in seventeen ninety and incorporated in seventeen ninety three st george was the capital till the senate and courts of justice were removed by sir james cockburn to hamilton which being centrally situated is more convenient hamilton which is situated on the inner part of the great sound had a population in nineteen o one of two thousand two hundred and forty six that of st george being nine hundred and eighty five in ireland island is situated the royal dockyard and naval establishment the harbour of st george's has space enough to accommodate a vast fleet yet till deepened by blasting the entrance was so narrow as to render it almost useless the bermudas became an important naval and coaling station in eighteen sixty nine when a large iron dry dock was towed across the atlantic and placed in a secure position in st george while owing to their important strategic position in mid-atlantic the british government maintains a strong garrison the bermudas are a british crown colony with a governor resident at hamilton who is assisted by an executive council of six members appointed by the crown a legislative council of nine similarly appointed and a representative assembly of thirty-six members of whom four are returned by each of nine parishes the currency of the colony which had formerly twelve shillings to the pound sterling was assimilated to that of england in eighteen forty two the english language is universal the colony is ecclesiastically attached to the bishopric of newfoundland in eighteen forty seven an educational board was established and there are numerous schools attendance is compulsory but none of the schools is free government scholarships enable youths to be educated for competition in the Rhodes Col scholarships to oxford university the revenue of the islands shows a fairly regular increase during the last years of the nineteenth century and the first of the twentieth as from thirty seven thousand eight hundred and thirty pounds in eighteen ninety five to sixty three thousand four hundred and fifty seven pounds in nineteen o four expenditure is normally rather less than revenue in the year last named imports were valued at five hundred and eighty nine thousand nine hundred and seventy nine pounds and exports at one hundred and thirty thousand three hundred and five pounds the annual averages since eighteen ninety five being about four hundred and twenty six thousand three hundred pounds and one hundred and twelve thousand five hundred pounds respectively the population shows a steady increase as from thirteen thousand nine hundred and forty eight in eighteen eighty one to seventeen thousand five hundred and thirty five in nineteen o one six thousand three hundred eighty three were whites and eleven thousand one hundred fifty two colored in the latter year history the discovery of the bermudas resulted from the shipwreck of juan bermudas a spaniard whose name they now bear when on a voyage from spain to cuba with a cargo of hogs early in the sixteenth century henry may an englishman suffered the same fate in fifteen ninety three and lastly sir george somers shared the destiny of the two preceding navigators in sixteen o nine sir george from whom the islands took the alternative name of somers was the first who established a settlement upon them but he died before he had fully accomplished his design in sixteen twelve the bermudas were granted to an offshoot of the virginia company which consisted of one hundred and twenty persons sixty of whom under the command of henry moore proceeded to the islands the first source of colonial wealth was the growing of tobacco but the curing industry ceased early in the eighteenth century in seventeen twenty six bishop george berkeley chose the bermudas as the seat of his projected missionary establishment 
first newspaper, the Bermuda Gazette, was published in 1784. End of Bermudas by Anonymous from the Encyclopedia Britannica of number 1910. General Directions for Making Bread by Mary Ronald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. General Directions for Making Bread by Mary Ronald. Time Required for Making Bread. Bread is often mixed the night before it is to be baked and left to rise from eight to ten hours but the whole process of bread making from the mixing to the serving can be done in two and a half hours if sufficient yeast is used in hot weather it is desirable to complete the work in a short time in order to prevent fermentation or souring which occurs if left too long a time four hours and a half is ample time for the whole process using the ordinary amount of yeast two hours for the mixing and rising of the sponge or dough one half hour for the kneading and moulding one hour for the loaves to rise in the pans and one hour for the baking raising the bread a thin batter called a sponge may be made at night and the rest of the flour added in the morning or the dough may be mixed and kneaded at night and only moulded into loaves in the morning but a better way especially in summer is to set the bread early in the morning and have it baked by noon it needs to rise twice once either in the sponge or in the dough and again after it is moulded into loaves the old way of letting it rise three times is unnecessary and increases the danger of souring if the dough gets very light before one is ready to work it it should be cut away from the sides of the pan and pressed down in the center with the knife this liberates some of the gas and retards the fermentation this can be done several times if it rises too high it will collapse which means souring but before that it loses its best flavor and so should not be allowed to more than double its bulk proportions of materials the proportions of flour liquid and yeast cannot be exactly given as flour of different qualities and degrees of dryness will absorb more or less liquid and the amount of yeast to be used depends both upon the time allowed and the temperature two cupfuls of liquid will take six to seven cupfuls of sifted flour and this will make two small loaves one half a compressed yeast cake will raise this amount in two hours if kept in a warm place the other ingredients for this quantity are one teaspoonful of salt one tablespoonful of sugar and one tablespoonful of butter lard or cotyledon if shortening is desired bread made with milk instead of water and with shortening is more tender than when water alone is used Boiled potatoes are sometimes added and give a more moist bread. Mixing Dissolve the yeast in a part of the tepid water. In the rest of the water mix the salt, sugar, and butter. Add the dissolved yeast and then stir in enough flour to make a soft dough which will not stick to the hands. If the flour is cold, warm it. If milk is used, scald it. Then allow it to become tepid before mixing it with the yeast. Place the pan in a warm place, free from draughts. When the dough is to be made into rolls or fancy forms, it needs to be a little stiffer than for loaves. Making a sponge A sponge is a thin batter made by mixing only a little flour with the other ingredients. This is left to stand until filled with large bubbles. The rest of the flour is then added to make the dough. When bread is to be made in a short time, it is better to set a sponge instead of making a dough at first, for in this way the second rising will be a little quicker. The crust on dough. When a dough is mixed and set aside to rise, cover the pan with several thicknesses of cloth to exclude the air and so prevent a crust forming on the top. It helps also to keep the dough at an even temperature. 
if a crust forms it is difficult to mix it in so thoroughly that it does not leave hard spots and lines in the bread there is a bread pen made with close fitting cover which is recommended kneading and molding when the dough is made it should be kneaded for twenty to thirty minutes turn it from the pan onto a board and work it by drawing it forward with the fingers and pushing it away with the balls of the hands turning it all the time this stretches the gluten and changes it from a sticky paste to a smooth elastic substance use as little flour on the board as possible and work it until it no longer sticks the more it is worked the finer will be the grain and the less flour used the better will be the bread baking when dough is made at the first mixing return it to the pan after it is kneaded and let it rise to double its size not more and then work it down mold it into loaves and let it rise a second time in the baking pans when a sponge is made knead the dough when the flour is added to the sponge and put it at once into the baking pans divide the dough evenly and shape it to the pans as well as possible filling the pans only half full cover and set them in a warm place free from draughts when they have doubled not more in size put them in the oven the loaf rises a little more in the oven if it is too light it is likely to fall which means it has soured and for this there is no remedy the loaf in the pan should rise in one hour care in baking is even more essential than care in mixing and raising the bread test the oven by putting in a teaspoon of flour if it browns the flour in five minutes the heat is right the fire have the fire prepared so it will not need replenishing during the hour required for the baking the bread rises after it goes in the oven and is likely to rise unevenly if the oven is hotter on one side than the other therefore it should be watched and turned carefully if necessary at the end of ten to fifteen minutes the top should be browned and this will arrest the rising if the oven is too cool the bread is likely to rise so much as to run over the pan or to have a hole in the center if the oven is too hot it will make a crust too soon the center be underdone and the crust be too thick time one hour is the time required for baking the ordinary sized loaf when the bread is taken from the oven turn it out of the pans and support the loaves in such a way that the air will reach all sides care of bread after it is baked if the loaves stand flat the bottom crust will become moist if wrapped in cloth it will do the same and give a soft crust which however some prefer to have it should not be put in the bread box until entirely cold baking bread rolls for baking rolls the rule is different from that for bread rolls should rise to be very light more than double their original size and the oven be hot enough to form a crust at once it should brown flour in one minute and bake the rolls in fifteen to twenty minutes flour the ordinary white flour of best quality is nearly all starch the nourishing parts of the wheat having been mostly all removed by the bolting to make it white the whole wheat flour makes a much more nourishing and health-giving bread and when the habit of eating it is once formed bread made of the white flour is no longer liked pans there is a variety of bread pans giving loaves of different shapes to be used for different purposes besides the square tin which gives the ordinary square loaf there is a sheet iron rounded pan open at the ends the dough for this pan is made into a long roll a little thicker in the middle than at the ends it gives the shape of the vienna loaf after the bread has risen cut it across the top in three diagonal slashes with a sharp knife when it is nearly baked brush over the top with a thin boiled cornstarch and it will further resemble the vienna loaf for dinner bread there is a pan a foot long of two flutes about two inches each across and open at the ends for this 
roll the dough long and round, or make two smaller rolls and twist them together. Bake in a hot oven like biscuits. This gives a long, round, crusty loaf like the French bread. A pan of small flutes is used for dinner sticks or finger rolls, giving a pencil of bread three-quarters of an inch thick and five inches long. Different shapes for variety. Breads made in different shapes gives a pleasant variety and often seems like a different article when baked so as to give more or less crust. End of General Directions for Making Bread by Mary Ronald, circa 1901. Geometry and Experience by Albert Einstein. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Geometry and Experience by Albert Einstein. An expanded form of an address to the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin on January 27, 1921. One reason why mathematics enjoys special esteem above all other sciences is that its laws are absolutely certain and indisputable, while those of all other sciences are to some extent debatable and in constant danger of being overthrown by newly discovered facts. In spite of this, the investigator in another department of science would not need to envy the mathematician if the laws of mathematics referred to objects of our mere imagination and not to objects of reality. For it cannot occasion surprise that different persons should arrive at the same logical conclusions when they have already agreed upon the fundamental laws, axioms, as well as the methods by which other laws are to be deduced therefrom. But there is another reason for the high repute of mathematics, in that it is mathematics which affords the exact natural sciences a certain measure of security, to which without mathematics they could not attain. At this point an enigma presents itself, which in all ages has agitated inquiring minds. How can it be that mathematics, being after all a product of human thought, which is independent of experience, is so admirably appropriate to the objects of reality. Is human reason, then, without experience, merely by taking thought, able to fathom the properties of real things? In my opinion, the answer to this question is, briefly, this. As far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain, and as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. It seems to me that complete clearness as to this state of things first became common property through that new departure in mathematics, which is known by the name of mathematical logic or axiomatics. The progress achieved by axiomatics consists in its having neatly separated the logical formal from its objective or intuitive content. According to axiomatics, the logical formal alone forms the subject matter of mathematics, which is not concerned with the intuitive or other content associated with the logical formal. Let us for a moment consider from this point of view any axiom of geometry. For instance, the following. Through two points in space, there always passes one and only one straight line. How is this axiom to be interpreted in the older sense and in the more modern sense? The older interpretation. Everyone knows what a straight line is and what a point is. Whether this knowledge springs from an ability of the human mind or from experience, from some collaboration of the two or from some other source, is not for the mathematician to decide. He leaves the question to the philosopher. Being based upon this knowledge, which precedes all mathematics, the axiom stated above is, like all other axioms, self-evident, that is, it is the expression of a part of this a priori knowledge. The more modern interpretation. 
geometry treats of entities which are denoted by the words straight line point etc these entities do not take for granted any knowledge or intuition whatever but they presuppose only the validity of the axioms such as the one stated above which are to be taken in a purely formal sense that is as void of all content of intuition or experience these axioms are free creations of the human mind all other propositions of geometry are logical inferences from the axioms which are to be taken in the nominalistic sense only the matter of which geometry treats is first defined by the axioms schlick in his book on epistemology has therefore characterized axioms very aptly as implicit definitions this view of axioms advocated by modern axiomatics purges mathematics of all extraneous elements and thus dispels the mystic obscurity which formerly surrounded the principles of mathematics but a presentation of its principles thus clarified makes it also evident that mathematics as such cannot predicate anything about perceptual objects or real objects in axiomatic geometry the words point straight line etc stand only for empty conceptual schemata that which gives them substance is not relevant to mathematics yet on the other hand it is certain that mathematics generally and particularly geometry owes its existence to the need which was felt of learning something about the relations of real things to one another the very word geometry which of course means earth measuring proves this for earth measuring has to do with the possibilities of the disposition of certain natural objects with respect to one another namely with parts of the earth measuring lines measuring ones etc it is clear that the system of concepts of axiomatic geometry alone cannot make any assertions as to the relations of real objects of this kind which we will call practically rigid bodies to be able to make such assertions geometry must be stripped of its merely logical formal character by the coordination of real objects of experience with the empty conceptual framework of axiomatic geometry to accomplish this we need only add the proposition solid bodies are related with respect to their possible dispositions as are bodies in euclidean geometry of three dimensions then the propositions of euclid contain affirmations as to the relations of practically rigid bodies geometry thus completed is evidently a natural science we may in fact regard it as the most ancient branch of physics its affirmations rest essentially on induction from experience but not on logical inferences only we will call this completed geometry practical geometry and shall distinguish it in what follows from purely axiomatic geometry the question whether the practical geometry of the universe is euclidean or not has a clear meaning and its answer can only be furnished by experience all linear measurement in physics is practical geometry in this sense so too is geodetic and astronomical linear measurement if we call to our help the law of experience that light is propagated in a straight line and indeed in a straight line in the sense of practical geometry i attach special importance to the view of geometry which i have just set forth because without it i should have been unable to formulate the theory of relativity without it the following reflection would have been impossible in a system of reference rotating relatively to an inert system the laws of disposition of rigid bodies do not correspond to the rules of euclidean geometry on account of the lorentz contraction thus if we admit non-inert systems we must abandon euclidean geometry the decisive step in the transition to general covariant equations 
would certainly not have been taken if the above interpretation had not served as a stepping stone if we deny the relation between the body of axiomatic euclidean geometry and the practically rigid body of reality we readily arrive at the following view which was entertained by that acute and profound thinker henri poincare euclidean geometry is distinguished above all other imaginable axiomatic geometries by its simplicity now since axiomatic geometry by itself contains no assertions as to the reality which can be experienced but can do so only in combination with physical laws it should be possible and reasonable whatever may be the nature of reality to retain euclidean geometry for if contradictions between theory and experience manifest themselves we should rather decide to change physical laws than to change axiomatic euclidean geometry if we deny the relation between the practically rigid body and geometry we shall indeed not easily free ourselves from the convention that euclidean geometry is to be retained as the simplest why is the equivalence of the practically rigid body and the body of geometry which suggests itself so readily denied by poincare and other investigators simply because under closer inspection the real solid bodies in nature are not rigid because their geometrical behavior that is their possibilities of relative disposition depend upon temperature external forces etc thus the original immediate relation between geometry and physical reality appears destroyed and we feel impelled toward the following more general view which characterizes poincare's standpoint geometry g predicates nothing about the relations of real things but only geometry together with the purport p of physical laws can do so using symbols we may say that only the sum of g plus p is subject to the control of experience thus g may be chosen arbitrarily and also parts of p all these laws are conventions all that is necessary to avoid contradictions is to choose the remainder of p so that g and the whole of p are together in accord with experience envisaged in this way axiomatic geometry and the part of natural law which has been given a conventional status appear as epistemologically equivalent subspecie eterni poincare in my opinion is right the idea of the measuring rod and the idea of the clock coordinated with it in the theory of relativity do not find their exact correspondence in the real world it is also clear that the solid body and the clock do not in the conceptual edifice of physics play the part of irreducible elements but that of composite structures which may not play any independent part in theoretical physics but it is my conviction that in the present stage of development of theoretical physics these ideas must still be employed as independent ideas for we are still far from possessing such certain knowledge of theoretical principles as to be able to give exact theoretical constructions of solid bodies and clocks further as to the objection that there are no really rigid bodies in nature and that therefore the properties predicated of rigid bodies do not apply to physical reality this objection is by no means so radical as might appear from a hasty examination for it is not a difficult task to determine the physical state of a measuring rod so accurately that its behavior relatively to other measuring bodies shall be sufficiently free from ambiguity to allow it to be substituted for the rigid body it is to measuring bodies of this kind that statements as to rigid bodies must be referred 
all practical geometry is based upon a principle which is accessible to experience and which we will now try to realize we will call that which is enclosed between two boundaries marked upon a practically rigid body a tract we imagine two practically rigid bodies each with a tract marked out on it these two tracts are said to be equal to one another if the boundaries of the one tract can be brought to coincide permanently with the boundaries of the other we now assume that if two tracts are found to be equal once and anywhere they are equal always and everywhere not only the practical geometry of euclid but also its nearest generalization the practical geometry of riemann and therewith the general theory of relativity rest upon this assumption of the experimental reasons which warrant this assumption i will mention only one the phenomenon of the propagation of light in empty space assigns a tract namely the appropriate part of light to each interval of local time and conversely thence it follows that the above assumption for tracts must also hold good for intervals of clock time in the theory of relativity consequently it may be formulated as follows if two ideal clocks are going at the same rate at any time and at any place being then in immediate proximity to each other they will always go at the same rate no matter where and when they are again compared with each other at one place if this law were not valid for real clocks the proper frequencies for the separate atoms of the same chemical element would not be in such exact agreement as experience demonstrates the existence of sharp spectral lines is a convincing experimental proof of the above-mentioned principle of practical geometry this is the ultimate foundation in fact which enables us to speak with meaning of the mensuration in riemann's sense of the word of the four-dimensional continuum of space-time the question whether the structure of this continuum is euclidean or in accordance with riemann's general scheme or otherwise is according to the view which is here being advocated properly speaking a physical question which must be answered by experience and not a question of a mere convention to be selected on practical grounds riemann's geometry will be the right thing if the laws of disposition of practically rigid bodies are transformable into those of the bodies of euclid's geometry with an exactitude which increases in proportion as the dimensions of the part of space-time under consideration are diminished it is true that this proposed physical interpretation of geometry breaks down when applied immediately to spaces of submolecular order of magnitude but nevertheless even in questions as to the constitution of elementary particles it retains part of its importance but even when it is a question of describing the electrical elementary particles constituting matter the attempt may still be made to ascribe physical importance to those ideas of fields which have been physically defined for the purpose of describing the geometrical behavior of bodies which are large as compared with the molecule success alone can decide as to the justification of such an attempt which postulates physical reality for the fundamental principles of riemann's geometry outside of the domain of their physical definitions it might possibly turn out that this extrapolation has no better warrant than the extrapolation of the idea of temperature to parts of a body of molecular order of magnitude it appears less problematical to extend the ideas of practical geometry to spaces of cosmic order of magnitude it might of course be objected that a construction composed of solid rods departs more and more from ideal rigidity in proportion as its spatial extent becomes greater but it will hardly be possible i think to assign fundamental significance to this objection 
therefore the question whether the universe is spatially finite or not seems to me decidedly a pregnant question in the sense of practical geometry i do not even consider it impossible that this question will be answered before long by astronomy let us call to mind what the general theory of relativity teaches in this respect it offers two possibilities one the universe is spatially infinite this can be so only if the average spatial density of the matter in universal space concentrated in the stars vanishes that is if the ratio of the total mass of the stars to the magnitude of the space through which they are scattered approximates indefinitely to the value zero when the spaces taken into consideration are constantly greater and greater two the universe is spatially finite this must be so if there is a mean density of the ponderable matter in universal space differing from zero the smaller the mean density the greater is the volume of universal space i must not fail to mention that a theoretical argument can be adduced in favor of the hypothesis of a finite universe the general theory of relativity teaches that the inertia of a given body is greater as there are more ponderable masses in proximity to it thus it seems very natural to reduce the total effect of inertia of a body to action and reaction between it and the other bodies in the universe as indeed ever since newton's time gravity has been completely reduced to action and reaction between bodies from the equations of the general theory of relativity it can be deduced that this total reduction of inertia to reciprocal action between masses as required by ernst mach for example is possible only if the universe is spatially finite on many physicists and astronomers this argument makes no impression experience alone can finally decide which of the two possibilities is realized in nature how can experience furnish an answer at first it might seem possible to determine the mean density of matter by observation of that part of the universe which is accessible to our perception this hope is illusory the distribution of the visible stars is extremely irregular so that we on no account may venture to set down the mean density of star matter in the universe as equal let us say to the mean density in the milky way in any case however great the space examined may be we could not feel convinced that there were no more stars beyond that space so it seems impossible to estimate the mean density but there is another road which seems to me more practicable although it also presents great difficulties for if we inquire into the deviations shown by the consequences of the general theory of relativity which are accessible to experience when these are compared with the consequences of the newtonian theory we first of all find a deviation which shows itself in close proximity to gravitating mass and has been confirmed in the case of the planet mercury but if the universe is spatially finite there is a second deviation from the newtonian theory which in the language of the newtonian theory may be expressed thus the gravitational field is in its nature such as if it were produced not only by the ponderable masses but also by a mass density of negative sign distributed uniformly throughout space since this factitious mass density would have to be enormously small it could make its presence felt only in gravitating systems of very great extent assuming that we know let us say the statistical distribution of the stars in the milky way as well as their masses then by newton's law we can calculate the gravitational field and the mean velocities which the stars must have so that the milky way should not collapse under the mutual attraction of its stars 
but should maintain its actual extent. Now, if the actual velocities of the stars, which can, of course, be measured, were smaller than the calculated velocities, we should have a proof that the actual attractions at great distances are smaller than by Newton's law. From such a deviation, it could be proved indirectly that the universe is finite. It would even be possible to estimate its spatial magnitude. Can we picture to ourselves a three-dimensional universe which is finite, yet unbounded? The usual answer to this question is no, but that is not the right answer. The purpose of the following remarks is to show that the answer should be yes. I want to show that without any extraordinary difficulty, we can illustrate the theory of a finite universe by means of a mental image to which, with some practice, we shall soon grow accustomed. First of all, an observation of epistemological nature. A geometrical physical theory, as such, is incapable of being directly pictured, being merely a system of concepts. But these concepts serve the purpose of bringing a multiplicity of real or imaginary sensory experiences into connection in the mind. To visualize a theory or bring it home to one's mind therefore means to give a representation to that abundance of experiences for which the theory supplies the schematic arrangement. In the present case, we have to ask ourselves how we can represent that relation of solid bodies with respect to their reciprocal disposition, contact, which corresponds to the theory of a finite universe. There is really nothing new in what I have to say about this, but innumerable questions addressed to me prove that the requirements of those who thirst for knowledge of these matters have not yet been completely satisfied. So, will the initiated please pardon me if part of what I shall bring forward has long been known? What do we wish to express when we say that our space is infinite? Nothing more than that we might lay any number whatever of bodies of equal size side by side without ever filling space. Suppose that we are provided with a great many wooden cubes all of the same size. In accordance with Euclidean geometry, we can place them above, beside, and behind one another, so as to fill a part of space of any dimensions. But this construction would never be finished. We could go on adding more and more cubes, without ever finding that there was no more room. That is what we wish to express when we say that space is infinite. It would be better to say that space is infinite in relation to practically rigid bodies, assuming that the laws of disposition for these bodies are given by Euclidean geometry. Another example of an infinite continuum is the plane. On a plane surface, we may lay squares of cardboard so that each side of any square has the side of another square adjacent to it. The construction is never finished. We can always go on laying squares, if their laws of disposition correspond to those of plane figures of Euclidean geometry. The plane is therefore infinite in relation to the cardboard squares. Accordingly, we say that the plane is an infinite continuum of two dimensions, and space an infinite continuum of three dimensions. What is here meant by the number of dimensions, I think I may assume to be known. Now we take an example of a two-dimensional continuum, which is finite, but unbounded. We imagine the surface of a large globe and a quantity of small paper discs, all of the same size. We place one of the discs anywhere on the surface of the globe. If we move the disc about, Anywhere we like on the surface of the globe, we do not come upon a limit or boundary anywhere on the journey. Therefore, we say that the spherical surface of the globe is an unbounded continuum. Moreover, the spherical surface is a finite continuum. 
for if we stick the paper discs on the globe so that no disc overlaps another the surface of the globe will finally become so full that there is no room for another disc this simply means that the spherical surface of the globe is finite in relation to the paper discs further the spherical surface is a non-euclidean continuum of two dimensions that is to say the laws of disposition for the rigid figures lying in it do not agree with those of the euclidean plane this can be shown in the following way place a paper disc on the spherical surface and around it in a circle place six more discs each of which is to be surrounded in turn by six discs and so on if this construction is made on a plane surface we have an uninterrupted disposition in which there are six discs touching every disc except those which lie on the outside on the spherical surface the construction also seems to promise success at the outset and the smaller the radius of the disc in proportion to that of the sphere the more promising it seems but as the construction progresses it becomes more and more patent that the disposition of the discs in the manner indicated without interruption is not possible as it should be possible by euclidean geometry of the plane surface in this way creatures which cannot leave the spherical surface and cannot even peep out from the spherical surface into three-dimensional space might discover merely by experimenting with discs that their two-dimensional space is not euclidean but spherical space from the latest results of the theory of relativity it is probable that our three-dimensional space is also approximately spherical that is that the laws of disposition of rigid bodies in it are not given by euclidean geometry but approximately by spherical geometry if only we consider parts of space which are sufficiently great now this is the place where the reader's imagination boggles nobody can imagine this thing he cries indignantly it can be said but cannot be thought i can represent to myself a spherical surface well enough but nothing analogous to it in three dimensions we must try to surmount this barrier in the mind and the patient reader will see that it is by no means a particularly difficult task for this purpose we will first give our attention once more to the geometry of two-dimensional spherical surfaces in the adjoining figure let k be the spherical surface touched at s by a plane e which for facility of presentation is shown in the drawing as a bounded surface let l be a disc on the spherical surface now let us imagine that at the point n of the spherical surface diametrically opposite to s there is a luminous point throwing a shadow l prime of the disc l upon the plane e every point on the sphere has its shadow on the plane if the disc on the sphere k is moved its shadow l prime on the plane e also moves when the disc l is at s it almost exactly coincides with its shadow if it moves on the spherical surface away from s upwards the disc shadow l prime on the plane also moves away from s on the plane outwards growing bigger and bigger as the disc l approaches the luminous point n the shadow moves off to infinity and becomes infinitely great now we put the question what are the laws of disposition of the disc shadows l prime on the plane e evidently they are exactly the same as the laws of disposition of the discs l on the spherical surface for to each original figure on k there is a corresponding shadow figure on e if two discs on k are touching their shadows on e also touch the shadow geometry on the plane agrees with the disc geometry on the sphere if we call the disc shadows rigid figures 
then spherical geometry holds good under plane E with respect to these rigid figures. Moreover, the plane is finite with respect to the disk shadows, since only a finite number of the shadows can find room on the plane. At this point somebody will say, that is nonsense. The disk shadows are not rigid figures. We have only to move a two-foot rule about on the plane E to convince ourselves that the shadows constantly increase in size as they move away from S on the plane towards infinity. But what if the two-foot rule were to behave on the plane E in the same way as the disk shadows L prime? It would then be impossible to show that the shadows increase in size as they move away from S. Such an assertion would then no longer have any meaning whatever. In fact, the only objective assertion that can be made about the disk shadows is just this, that they are related in exactly the same way as are the rigid disks on the spherical surface in the sense of Euclidean geometry. We must carefully bear in mind that our statement as to the growth of the disk shadows as they move away from S towards infinity has in itself no objective meaning as long as we are unable to employ Euclidean rigid bodies which can be moved about on the plane E for the purpose of comparing the size of the disk shadows. In respect of the laws of disposition of the shadows L prime, the point S has no special privileges on the plane any more than on the spherical surface. The representation given above of spherical geometry on the plane is important for us because it readily allows itself to be transferred to the three-dimensional case. Let us imagine a point S of our space and a great number of small spheres L prime which can all be brought to coincide with one another. But these spheres are not to be rigid in the sense of Euclidean geometry. Their radius is to increase, in the sense of Euclidean geometry, when they are moved away from S towards infinity, and this increase is to take place in exact accordance with the same law as applies to the increase of the radii of the disk shadows L prime on the plane. After having gained a vivid mental image of the geometrical behavior of our L prime spheres, let us assume that in our space there are no rigid bodies at all in the sense of Euclidean geometry, but only bodies having the behavior of our L prime spheres. Then we shall have a vivid representation of three dimensional spherical space, or rather of three dimensional spherical geometry. Here our spheres must be called rigid spheres. Their increase in size as they depart from S is not to be detected by measuring with measuring rods any more than in the case of the disk shadows on E, because the standards of measurements behave in the same way as the spheres. Space is homogeneous, that is to say, the same spherical configurations are possible in the environment of all points. This is intelligible without calculation, but only for the two-dimensional case, if we revert once more to the case of the disk on the surface of the sphere. Our space is finite because in consequence of the growth of the spheres, only a finite number of them can find room in space. In this way, by using as stepping stones the practice in thinking and visualization which Euclidean geometry gives us, we have acquired a mental picture of spherical geometry. We may, without difficulty, impart more depth and vigor to these ideas by carrying out special imaginary constructions. Nor would it be difficult to represent the case of what is called elliptical geometry in an analogous manner. My only aim today has been to show that the human faculty of visualization is by no means bound to capitulate to non-Euclidean geometry. End of Geometry and Experience by Albert Einstein Read by Avai in November 2010
Gifts by Ralph Waldo Emerson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gifts of one who loves me. T'was high time they came. When he ceased to love me, time they stopped for shame. It is said that the world is in a state of bankruptcy, that the world owes the world more than the world can pay, and ought to go into chancery and be sold. I do not think this general insolvency, which involves in some sort all the population, to be the reason for the difficulty experienced at Christmas and New Year, and other times, in bestowing gifts, since it is always so pleasant to be generous, though very vexatious to pay debts. But the impediment lies in the choosing. If at any time it comes into my head that a present is due from me to somebody, I am puzzled what to give until the opportunity is gone. Flowers and fruits are always fit presents. Flowers because they are a proud assertion that a ray of beauty outvalues all the utilities of the world. These gay natures contrast with the somewhat stern countenance of ordinary nature. They are like music heard out of a workhouse. Nature does not cocker us. We are children, not pets. She is not fond. Everything is dealt to us without fear or favor, after severe universal laws. Yet these delicate flowers look like the frolic and interference of love and beauty. Men used to tell us that we love flattery, even though we are not deceived by it, because it shows that we are of importance enough to be courted. Something like that pleasure the flowers give us, what am I to choose those sweet hints are addressed? Fruits are acceptable gifts because they are flowers of commodity and admit of fantastic values being attached to them. If a man should send to me to come a hundred miles to visit him and should set before me a basket of fine summer fruit, I should think there was some proportion between the labor and the reward. For common gifts, necessity makes pertinences and beauty every day, and one is glad when an imperative leaves him no option, since if the man at the door have no shoes, you have not to consider whether you could procure him a paint box, and as it is always pleasing to see a man eat bread or drink water, in the house or out of doors, so it is always a great satisfaction to supply these first wants. Necessity does everything well. In our condition of universal dependence, it seems heroic to let the petitioner be the judge of his necessity and to give all that is asked, though at great inconvenience. If it be a fantastic desire, it is better to leave others the office of punishing him. I can think of many parts I should prefer playing to that of the Furies. Next, to things of necessity, the rule for a gift which one of my friends prescribed is that we might convey to some person that which properly belonged to his character and was easily associated with him in thought. But our tokens of compliment and love are for the most part barbarous. Rings and other jewels are not gifts, but apologies for gifts. The only gift is a portion of thyself. Thou must bleed for me. Therefore the poet brings his poem, the shepherd his lamb, the farmer corn, the miner a gem, the sailor coral and shelves, the painter his picture, the girl a handkerchief of her own sewing. This is right and pleasing, 
for it restores society in so far to the primary basis when a man's biography is conveyed in his gift and every man's wealth is an index of his merit but it is a cold lifeless business when you go to the shops to buy me something which does not represent your life and talent but a goldsmith's this is fit for kings and rich men who represent kings in a false state of property to make presents of gold and silver stuffs as a kind of symbolical sin offering or a payment of blackmail. The law of benefits is a difficult channel which requires careful sailing or rude boats. It is not the office of a man to receive gifts. How dare you give them? We wish to be self-sustained. We do not quite forgive a giver. The hand that feeds us is in some danger of being bitten. We can receive anything from love, for that is a way of receiving it from ourselves, but not from anyone who assumes to bestow. We sometimes hate the meat which we eat, because there seems something of degrading dependence in living by it. Brother, if Jove to thee a present make, take heed that from his hands thou nothing take. We ask the whole. Nothing less will content us. We arraign society if it do not give us besides earth and fire and water, opportunity, love, reference, and objects of veneration. He is a good man who can receive a gift well. We are either glad or sorry at a gift, and both emotions are unbecoming. Some violence, I think, is done, some degradation born, when I rejoice or grieve at a gift. I am sorry when my independence is invaded, or when a gift comes from such as do not know my spirit, and so the act is not supported, and if the gift pleases me overmuch, then I should be ashamed that the donor should read my heart and see that I love his commodity and not him. The gift, to be true, must be the flowing of the giver unto me, correspondent to my flowing unto him. When the waters are at level, then my goods pass to him, and his to me. All his are mine, and all mine his. I say to him, How can you give me this pot of oil, or this flagon of wine, when all your oil and wine is mine, which belief of mine this gift seems to deny? Whence the fitness of beautiful, not useful things for gifts, this giving is flat usurpation, and therefore when the beneficiary is ungrateful, as all beneficiaries hate all Timons, not at all considering the value of the gift, but looking back to the greater store it was taken from, I rather sympathize with the beneficiary than with the anger of my Lord Timon. For the expectation of gratitude is mean, and is continually punished by the total insensibility of the obliged person. It is a great happiness to get off without injury and heart burning from one who has had the ill luck to be served by you. It is a very onerous business, this of being served, and the debtor naturally wishes to give you a slap. A golden text for these gentlemen is that which I so admire in the Buddhist, who never thanks, and who says, do not flatter your benefactors. The reason for these discords I conceive to be that there is no commensurability between a man and any gift. You cannot give anything to a magnanimous person. After you have served him, he at once puts you in debt by his magnanimity. The service a man renders his friends is trivial and selfish compared with the service he knows his friends stood in readiness to yield him. Alike before he had begun to serve his friend, and now also. Compared with that goodwill I bear my friend, the benefit 
it is in my power to render him seem small. Besides, our action on each other, good as well as evil, is so incidental and at random that we can seldom hear the acknowledgments to any person who would thank us for a benefit without some shame and humiliation. We can rarely strike a direct stroke, but must be content with an oblique one. We seldom have the satisfaction of yielding a direct benefit, which is directly received. But rectitude scatters favor on every side without knowing it, and receives with wonder the thanks of all people. I fear to breathe any treason against the majesty of love, which is the genius and God of gifts, and to whom we must not affect to prescribe. Let him give kingdoms, or flower, leaves indifferently. There are persons from whom we always expect fairy tokens. Let us not cease to expect them. This is prerogative, and not to be limited by our municipal rules. For the rest, I like to see that we cannot be bought and sold. The best of hospitality and of generosity is also not in the will, but in fate. I find that I am not much to you. You do not need me. You do not feel me. Then am I thrust out of doors, though you proffer me house and lands. No services are of any value but only likeness. When I have attempted to join myself to others by services, it proved an intellectual trick, and no more. They eat your service like apples, and leave you out, but love them, and they feel you, and delight in you all the time. Gifts by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read by Nanafella Introduction to a Traveller's Narrative, written to illustrate the episode of The Bob, by Edward Granville Brown. Part 1. Introduction. This book is the history of a prescribed and persecuted sect, written by one of themselves. After suffering in silence for nigh upon half a century, they at length find voice to tell their tale and offer their apology. Of this voice I am the interpreter. So many Persian works of universally acknowledged and incontrovertible merit remain unpublished, not only in Europe, but in the East, that one who offers to the public as the result of his study and labor the translation and text of a quite recent compilation whereof the authorship must remain unknown and which must therefore rely solely on whatever intrinsic interest and merit it may possess may reasonably be expected to state the considerations which have led him to select for publication such a work this book is as i have said recent in composition for as appears from a passage which will be found on page sixty seven it was written probably during the year eighteen eighty six it is also anonymous this could not well be otherwise for what persian could with ordinary prudence acknowledge a work written in defence of a faith whereof the name is scarce mentioned in persia without fear and trembling so that these two things which some might incline to account grave defects in the book and reasons against its publication are in truth inherent in its very nature and character it is of quite modern origin because it treats of a recent movement of which the first beginnings are remembered by many still living it is anonymous because every promoter of that movement is in the country which gave it birth 
as a man quote, sitting beneath a sword suspended by a single hair who knoweth not when it shall descend upon him whether it shall descend instantly or after a while end quote. note see page one fifty infra end note if then the subject treated of in this book be of sufficient interest and importance to merit careful study and if the book itself notwithstanding our ignorance of its authorship can be shown to proceed from a trustworthy source i am sufficiently justified in having decided to edit and translate this traveller's narrative now it appears to me that the history of the bobby movement must be interesting in different ways to others besides those who are directly engaged in the study of persian to the student of religious thought it will afford no little matter for reflection for here he may contemplate such personalities as by lapse of time pass into heroes and demigods still unobscured by myth and fable he may examine by the light of concurrent and independent testimony one of those strange outbursts of enthusiasm faith fervent devotion and indomitable heroism or fanaticism if you will which we are accustomed to associate with the earlier history of the human race he may witness in a word the birth of a faith which may not impossibly win a place amidst the great religions of the world to the ethnologist also it may yield food for thought as to the character of a people who stigmatized as they often have been as selfish mercenary avaricious egotistical sordid and cowardly are yet capable of exhibiting under the influence of a strong religious impulse a degree of devotion disinterestedness generosity unselfishness nobility and courage which may be paralleled in history but can scarcely be surpassed to the politician too the matter is not devoid of importance for what changes may not be effected in a country now reckoned almost as a cipher in the balance of national forces by a religion capable of evoking so mighty a spirit let those who know what muhammad made the arabs consider well what the bab may yet make the persians but to myself and i believe to most others who have been or shall be brought to consider this matter the paramount interest thereof lies in this that here is something whether wise or unwise whether tending towards the amelioration of mankind or the reverse which seem to many hundreds if not thousands of our fellow creatures worth suffering and dying for and which on this ground alone must be accounted worthy of our most attentive study i have now to explain how this book came into my hands what so far as i have been able to learn were the causes which led to its composition and why with certain reservations which will be presently specified we are warranted in regarding it as a true and authentic account of the events which it relates in order to make this explanation clear it is necessary for me to describe briefly how my attention was first directed towards this subject how my interest in it was kindled how the means of investigating it were made available to me and how the investigation whereof this book is at present the final outcome was conducted one day some seven years ago i was searching amongst the books in the university library of cambridge 
for fresh materials for an essay on the sufi philosophy in the study of which i was then chiefly engaged when my eye was caught by the title of count gobineau's religions et philosophie dans l'asie centrale i took down the book glanced through it to discover whether or no it contained any account of the sufis and finding that a short chapter was devoted to them brought it back with me to my rooms my first superficial glance had also shown me that a considerable portion of the book was taken up with an account of the babis of which sect i had at that time no definite knowledge save a general idea that they had been subjected to a most severe persecution the perusal of gobineau's chapter on the sufis caused me i must frankly confess no small mortification for i was an ardent admirer of these eloquent mystics whose spirit has inspired so much of what is best and finest in persian literature and a rude shock was inflicted on my susceptibilities by such words as these le quietisme le bang et l'opium l'ivrognerie la plus abjecte voilà surtout ce qu'elle le soufisme a produit when however i turned from this mournful chapter to that portion of the book which treated of the bobby movement the case was altogether different to any one who has already read this masterpiece of historical composition this most perfect presentation of accurate and critical research in the form of a narrative of thrilling and sustained interest such as one may indeed hope to find in the drama or the romance but can scarcely expect from the historian it is needless to describe the effect which it produced on me to any one who has not read it i can only say let him do so forthwith if he is in any way interested in the history of the bobbies many new facts may be added to those recorded by gobineau and the history which he carried down to a d eighteen fifty two needs to be supplemented by an appendix detailing the events of the last thirty-eight years but the narrative of the first origin of barbeism can hardly be told better than he has told it certainly not in a style more eloquent nor in a manner more worthy of the subject count gobineau's book then affected in a certain sense a complete revolution in my ideas and projects i had long ardently desired to visit persia and above all shiraz and this desire was now greatly intensified but whereas i had previously wished to see shiraz because it was the home of hafez and of sa'di i now wish to see it because it was the birthplace of mirza ali muhammad the bab and after shiraz not tus and nishapur but zanjan mazandaran and tabriz were the objects of my eager desire my impatience too was greatly increased for i reflected that although there must be many still living who had witnessed or even taken part in the events of which i was so anxious to discover every slightest detail each year that passed would materially lessen their number and render even fainter the possibility of restoring the picture in its entirety besides this i was eager to know more of the doctrines which could inspire such heroism and to gain this knowledge as i clearly perceived there was but one satisfactory and effectual method 
as Anquetil du Perron had succeeded in unlocking the secrets of the Zoroastrian religion by going amongst those who professed it, winning their confidence, and eventually, after infinite patience and endeavour, obtaining copies of their sacred books and a clue to their contents, so I, if I were to succeed in fathoming the mysteries of the Babi faith, must go to the land of its origin strive to become intimate with some of its votaries and from these obtain the knowledge which i sought let no one suppose that i am so presumptuous as to institute any comparison between anquetil du perron and myself his task was one which only rare courage perseverance and genius could bring to a successful issue he had to induce the suspicious taciturn and uncommunicative priests of an ancient national religion actuated by no desire of making proselytes to impart to him a secret doctrine and ritual hitherto most jealously guarded and when at length the sacred books were gained they were books written in a language so long dead that over it had formed a deposit of commentaries in a speed which had grown flourished and died since it had been a spoken tongue added to this anquetil's investigations were conducted amidst hardships privations and dangers of an exceptional kind the barbies on the contrary would i was convinced be eager to impart their doctrines to any inquirer on whose discretion and fidelity they could place reliance their sacred books moreover were either in arabic or in persian and beyond a certain reserve and obscurity necessitated by prudential motives and a peculiar terminology such as all sects whether philosophical or religious possess i anticipated no particular difficulty in understanding them one special obstacle it was true did exist in this case to the primary establishment of relations of intimacy the bobbies were a proscribed sect whereof every member was practically liable to outlawry and even death should he allow his creed to become known it seemed probable enough therefore that i should at first have some difficulty in discovering them and putting myself into communication with them yet could i but find means of spending a few months in persia it would be hard i thought if some lucky chance did not bring me in contact with some barbi who would venture to take me into his confidence and if the first step could be won i relied on the fair knowledge of colloquial persian which i already possessed the general acquaintance with the bobby doctrines which gobineau's work had given me the genuine admiration which i felt for the bob and his apostles and the close brotherhood which according to all analogy must probably exist within the sect to affect the rest meanwhile the first step was to get to persia and of this there seemed to be but little chance anquetil du perron would have gone chance or no chance and either attained his object or perished in the search i not being fashioned in so heroic a mould waited for the means i made several fruitless attempts to obtain some appointment which would take me to the land of my quest and finally at a last resource offered myself as a candidate for a medical post in the realms of the nizam of haydarabad on the chance that there i might find means of visiting persia here again i was unsuccessful and i was beginning to despair of attaining my object when suddenly and unexpectedly that thing befell me which is as i believe 
the greatest good fortune which can fall to the lot of one eager to pursue a scientific inquiry from which he is debarred by lack of means a fellowship became vacant at my college and to this fellowship i was elected this happened on may thirtieth eighteen eighty seven five months later i had crossed the turco-persian frontier and was within three stages of tabriz of the disappointments and failures which i at first met with in my attempts to discover and communicate with the babis of the fortunate chance which at length placed the clue in my hand and of the fulfilment of my hopes in a manner surpassing my most sanguine expectations i have already spoken in another place note journal of the royal asiatic society for eighteen eighty nine volume twenty one new series pages four eighty six to four eighty nine four ninety five to four ninety six five o one etc End note. of these and other things incidental to my journey i may perhaps give a fuller account at some future time here it is sufficient for me to state that i returned to england in october eighteen eighty eight having visited zanjan tabriz shiraz and sheikh tabarsi the places most intimately associated with Balbi history having lived on terms of intimacy for periods varying from a few days to many weeks with the principal Babis at esfahan shiraz yazd and kerman and bringing with me a number of Babi books and writings as well as journals wherein the gist of every important conversation with any member of the sect was carefully recorded so soon as i had established myself once more in the college which four years absence from cambridge and a year's travelling in persia had served to render yet more dear to me i set to work to make a systematic examination of the materials collected during my journey the persian bayan the iqan the kitab aqdas the epistles to the kings the tarikh jadid and a host of more or less important letters memoranda poems and abstracts were read digested and indexed and the outcome of this and my previous labour together with a brief account of my journey was laid before the public in two articles comprising in all one hundred seventy pages of which the first appeared in july the second in october eighteen eighty nine in the journal of the royal asiatic society to these articles i shall continually have occasion to refer in the course of this work and for the sake of brevity i shall henceforth generally denote them as b one and b two the preparation of these articles in conjunction with other work kept me occupied till the autumn of eighteen eighty nine when the main results of my investigations having been satisfactorily recorded i was left at liberty to turn my attention to matters of detail it appeared to me extremely desirable that texts or translations of the chief bobby works should be published in extenso the only question was which to begin with inasmuch as it seemed likely that the historical aspects of the movement would prove more generally interesting than its doctrinal aspects i finally determined to publish first the text and translation of the tarikh -e jadid note concerning the tarikh -e jadid see note a at end pages one ninety two to one ninety seven infra end note and this determination was approved by several of my friends and correspondents whose knowledge entitled them to speak with authority this text and translation i accordingly began to prepare and the former was completely copied out for the printer awaiting only collation with the british museum text note this collation has since been effected and the variants offered by the british museum manuscript proved to be both numerous and important should the publication of the work be proceeded with it would be necessary to collate also the defective manuscript 
recently acquired by the st petersburg library the closing words of which occur on page two thirty five of my manuscript see note one at the foot of page one ninety two infra and the forthcoming sixth volume of baron rosen's collection scientifique page two forty four end note while the latter was in an advanced stage of progress when circumstances immediately to be detailed occurred which postponed the completion of that work and substituted for it another the present my researches amongst the babis in persia had at a comparatively early stage revealed to me the fact that since count gobineau composed his work great changes had taken place in their organization and attitude i had expected to find mirza yahya subh azal hazrat azal as gobineau calls him universally acknowledged by them as the bab's successor and the sole head to whom they confessed allegiance my surprise was great when i discovered that so far from this being the case the majority of babis spoke only of baha as their chief and prophet asserted that the bab was merely his herald and forerunner those who had read the gospels and they were many likened the bab to john the baptist and baha to christ and either entirely ignored or strangely disparaged mirza yahya it took me some time fully to grasp this new and unexpected position of affairs and perhaps i should not have succeeded in doing so had it not been for the knowledge of the former state of things which i had obtained from gobineau's work and the acquaintance which i subsequently made in kerman of five or six persons who adhered to what i may call the quote, old dispensation end quote, and regarded mirza yahya subh azal as the legitimate and sole successor of the bab to state briefly a long story the case stands thus one mirza ali muhammad the bab during his life chose from amongst his most faithful and most gifted disciples eighteen persons called the letters of the living Horu who together with himself the point Nokte, constituted the sacred hierarchy of nineteen called the first unity Vahede aval of these letters i have not been able to obtain a complete list and indeed it would appear that the whole hierarchy was never made known mirza yahya sobhe azal held the fourth place in this hierarchy and on the death of the point and the two first letters rose by a natural process of promotion to the position of chief of the sect note see note one on page ninety five infra end note baha whose proper name is mirza hossein ali of nur was also according to gobineau note religions et philosophie page two seventy seven end note included in the unity gobineau has however mistaken the relationship which existed between him and mirza yahya that the two are brothers or rather half-brothers born of the same father by different wives is a fact established by convincing testimony note compare pages fifty six note two sixty three top and three seventy three end note two mirza ali muhammad the bab declared explicitly and repeatedly in all his works that the religion established by him and the books revealed to him were in no way final that his followers must continually expect the advent of him whom god shall manifest who would perfect and complete this religion that though he whom god shall manifest would not it was hoped delay his appearance for more than one thousand five hundred eleven or at most two thousand one years these numbers being represented in kabbalistic fashion by the words rieth and musteroth he might appear at any time and that whenever one should appear claiming to be he whom god shall manifest his very being together with his power of revealing verses 
would be his sufficient signs all who believed in the bob were solemnly warned not to reject one so characterized and making such a claim and were commanded in case of doubt to incline towards belief rather than disbelief three during the sojourn of the bobby exiles at adrianople baha according to nabil in a d eighteen sixty six to seven suddenly claimed to be he whom god shall manifest in proof of which he revealed sundry signs ere yet in eloquent arabic and persian wherein he summoned all the babis to acknowledge him as their supreme and sole chief and spiritual guide most of the babis eventually made this acknowledgment vowed allegiance to baha and thereby became bahais some few refused to transfer their allegiance from mirza yahya subh azal who himself strenuously resisted baha's claims which he regarded in the light of an usurpation and rebellion and these were thenceforth known as azalis thus did the great schism take place which divided the babis into two unequal parties a large majority of whose unbounded and almost incredible love and reverence the object is baha a small minority whose eager gaze is directed not to acre in syria but to famagusta in cyprus where dwells the exiled chief whom they refuse to disavow needless is it to say how bitter is the animosity which subsists between the bahais and the azalis amongst both factions i have found good men and faithful friends and from the chiefs of both and their sons i have met with much kindness wherefore i would for the present touch as lightly as may be on this painful matter leaving my readers to draw their own conclusions from what is hereinafter set forth the general nature of the arguments for and against either side will be found summarized at pages five fourteen and five fifteen of my first and pages nine ninety seven to nine ninety eight of my second article on the barbies in the j r a s to which i refer such of my readers as are curious to examine the matter more minutely of one thing there can in my opinion be but little doubt the future if barbeism as i most firmly believe has a future belongs to baha and his successors and followers with most of the facts summarized above i became acquainted during my sojourn in persia but i was unable to learn for certain whether mirza yahya subh azal was still alive nor could i ascertain in what part of cyprus he had fixed his residence a dervish with whom i became acquainted in kerman told me that he had visited him but could not remember the name of the town wherein he dwelt and none of the azalis whom i saw could give me any more precise information in my first paper on the barbies in the j r a s pages five sixteen to five seventeen i was therefore compelled to confess my failure in all attempts to elucidate this point at the same time i pointed out how much precious information might be gained from subh azal if he were still alive and how extremely desirable it was in the interests of science that this matter should be cleared up after the publication of my first and during the preparation of my second paper i began to institute inquiries on this point my sister who was then travelling in the east succeeded in obtaining the first clue from mr g i houston who was kind enough to procure for me definite proof that subh azal was still alive and was residing with his family at famagusta shortly after this my friend dr f h h guillemard who had spent many months in cyprus and had friends in all parts of the island 
very obligingly wrote to mr c d cobham commissioner at larnaca and to captain young commissioner at famagusta asking them to obtain for me the fullest information possible relative to the bobby exiles in cyprus i myself wrote at the same time stating the nature of the information which i sought both captain young and mr cobham responded to my request with a kindness for which i cannot sufficiently express my gratitude and so vigorously and energetically did they push their inquiries that i was soon in possession of all the chief facts relating to the bobby exiles captain young indeed spared no pains to clear up every point connected with the inquiry the day after he received my letter he paid a visit to subh azal questioned him concerning his life his adventures and his doctrines asked for information on sundry points mentioned in my paper and forwarded to me a complete account of all that he had learned nor was this all for he succeeded so well in winning subh azal's confidence that with this first letter dated july twenty eighth eighteen eighty nine he was able to forward a manuscript of one of the bob's works whereof so far as i know no copy had previously reached europe through captain young i was able to address directly to subh azal letters containing questions on numerous matters connected with the history doctrine and literature of the babis to all of which letters i received most full and courteous replies subh azal further sent me at different times several other manuscripts a complete list of such of the bob's works as had been in his possession at baghdad note c note u at end end note and a brief history of the bobby movement written by himself besides numerous letters each one of which contained most precious information this correspondence which opened out so rich a mine of new facts was but in an early stage when my second paper on the bobbies was published in the j r a s for october eighteen eighty nine but i was able to add to it an appendix pages nine ninety four to nine ninety eight embodying the more important results of the inquiry undertaken by captain young mr cobham and mr houston a fuller and more accurate account of subh azal and the other bobby exiles in cyprus based on the inquiries of the above-mentioned gentlemen the examination of official documents and the statements made to me by subh azal his sons and others will be found in note w at the end of this book it is therefore unnecessary for me to allude further to this correspondence at present while i was in persia i had already formed the intention of visiting acre and learning the doctrine of baha from the fountain-head from the moment when i discovered that subh azal was still alive i further resolved to visit him also for from repeated personal interviews i anticipated results which could not be obtained by a correspondence however elaborate i was also anxious for my own satisfaction to see those who since the bob's death had been the leaders of the bobby movement without this i felt that my researches would lack that completeness which i wished to give them the motives which impelled me towards acre and famagusta were equally strong but somewhat different at the former place i expected to see the mainspring and fulcrum of a mighty force with the outstanding results of which i had become practically acquainted in persia and from which i believed as i still believe that results yet more wonderful might be expected in the future at the latter place i hoped to converse with one whom the bob had recognized as his immediate successor and vice-regent 
one who had been personally acquainted with mulla hussein of bushra way mulla sheikh ali suleiman khan qurratul ain and in short almost all of those whose devoted lives and heroic deaths had first inspired my enthusiasm one moreover who represented the spirit and tradition of the old barbeism which in the hands of baha had already undergone important modifications and indeed become almost a new religion various considerations decided me to visit cyprus first of which two only need be mentioned here firstly it was practically certain that no obstacle to my seeing subh -e azal would arise while it was by no means certain that i should be able to see baha secondly the logical order of procedure was to begin with the investigation of the old order of things and having completed this to continue the examination of the new i hoped however to make one journey suffice for the attainment of both objects but allowing for the time which must be consumed in actual travelling it was clear that at least two months would be required for the enterprise the long vacation was amply sufficient for the purpose but the summer was the most unsustainable season for such a journey and i therefore determined to petition the university for such extension of leave at easter as would enable me to absent from england for two months the university ever ready to facilitate research of every kind granted me permission to absent myself from cambridge from march fourth till may third eighteen ninety and accordingly leaving england on the date first mentioned i landed at larnaca in cyprus on march nineteenth captain young and mr cobham on becoming acquainted with my intention of visiting cyprus had with that ready kindness and hospitality which so far as my experience goes are rarely lacking in englishmen resident in the east written to ask me to be their guest during such time as i might desire to remain in famagusta or larnaca so that i was entirely relieved of all anxiety as to the possibility of finding a base of operations for my researches captain young further counselled me in case i wished to gain access to the official records of the island government to obtain before leaving england such letters of recommendation as might ensure the attainment of this object i accordingly applied for help in obtaining these to major general sir frederick goldsmid whose long residence in persia and intimate knowledge of the persian people and language had led him to take some interest in my communications on the subject of the barbies to the royal asiatic society he spared no pains to further my plans and introduced me to sir robert biddulph who very kindly gave me a letter to sir henry bulwer the governor-general of cyprus asking him to allow me so far as might be permissible or expedient to inspect such official documents as might throw light on the object of my investigations in larnaca i spent only one day the shortness of the time at my disposal and my eagerness to see sobhe azal compelling me with great reluctance to forgo the pleasure which a more prolonged sojourn under mr cobham's hospitable roof would have afforded me the day passed most pleasantly for in my host i found not only an accomplished oriental scholar and a traveller to whom few regions of the habitable globe were unknown but a genial friend and a warm sympathizer in my researches mr cobham had studied persian for some time with mushkin Kalam, one of the bahai exiles sent with subh -e azal to cyprus note concerning mushkin Kalam, c b one page five sixteen 
b two pages nine ninety four to nine ninety five and note w at end end note and from him had learned much concerning the new religion subh -e azal however he had not seen for mushkin qalam as was natural had spoken only of baha and had entirely ignored the existence of a chief whose authority he disavowed on the following day thursday march twentieth eighteen ninety i bade farewell to mr cobham and after some six hours spent in a somewhat antiquated vehicle belonging to a loquacious italian who had fought for garibaldi found myself at famagusta or rather its suburb varoshia where i met with a most cordial welcome from captain and lady evelyn young captain young at once sent a message to subh -e azal's son abdul ali who keeps a shop in varoshia requesting him to come to the Qonaq. in a short time he appeared and i was much struck by the refinement of his manner the intelligence revealed by his countenance and conversation and the courteousness of his address our conversation was conducted in persian which though he had never been in persia he spoke as his mother tongue it was soon arranged that i should visit subh -e azal on the following day at whatever time he should appoint next morning we received a message to the effect that subh -e azal was prepared to receive us as soon as we could come at about eleven a m therefore captain young drove me into the town which is situated about a mile from the suburb of varoshia as i had not entered within the walls of famagusta on the preceding day i now saw for the first time the massive fortifications the multitudinous churches whereof the number as is currently reported by the inhabitants equals the number of days in the year and the desolate neglected streets of that most interesting relic of the middle ages after captain young had transacted some other business we proceeded to subh -e azal's abode in the courtyard of which we were received by his sons abdul ali rezvan ali abdul wahed and dakdiyuddin and an old babi of zanjan who had settled in the island so as to be near his master accompanied by these with the exception of the last mentioned we ascended to an upper room where a venerable and benevolent-looking old man of about sixty years of age somewhat below the middle height with ample forehead on which long-cherished desire was fulfilled i stood face to face with mirza yahya subh -e azal the morning of eternity the appointed successor of the bab the fourth letter of the first unity this my first interview was necessarily short and somewhat formal for i had yet to win the confidence of subh -e azal and induce him little by little to speak without reserve of those things whereof i so earnestly desired to hear in this thanks to the confidence with which captain young's kindness had already inspired subh -e azal and the very vivid picture of the chief actors in the bobby movement which first derived from the perusal of count gobineau's work had continued to glow and glow in my mind till it became almost as a part of my personal experience i was completely successful during the fortnight which i spent at famagusta i visited subh -e azal daily remaining with him as a rule from two or three o'clock in the afternoon until sunset lack of space forbids me from describing in detail and consecutive order the conversations which took place on these occasions notebook and pencil in hand i sat before him day by day and every evening i returned to verocia with a rich store of new facts most of which will be found recorded in the notes wherewith i have striven to illustrate or check the statements advanced in the following pages apart from the delight inseparable from successful research my stay at famagusta was a very pleasant one 
for from every one with whom i came in contact but most of all from captain and lady evelyn young i met with a kindness which i can never forget besides my visits to subh -e azal in the afternoon i often spent some portion of the morning with his son abdul ali and we were sometimes joined by rezvan ali or by one or other of the few azalis who have settled in famagusta during these conversations i learned many new facts of greater or less importance the reserve which had at first been apparent in subh -e azal gradually disappeared and at each successive interview i found him more communicative although our conversation was chiefly on religious topics and the history biography doctrine and literature of the babis other matters were occasionally discussed of the bab and his few apostles and followers as of his own life and adventures subh -e azal would speak freely but concerning the origin of the schism which for him had been attended with such disastrous results and all pertaining to baha and the baha'is he was most reticent so that perceiving this subject to be distasteful i refrained for the most part from alluding to it during these conferences subh -e azal's sons were always present though they hardly spoke in the presence of their father towards whom they observed the utmost deference and respect tea was always served in the persian fashion but tobacco in all forms was conspicuous by its absence the azalis unlike the baha'is following the injunctions of the bab in this matter in the course of each visit or sometimes when i was leaving the house subh -e azal's youngest son taqiyuddin a pretty graceful child about thirteen years of age used to present me with a little bunch of roses or such other flowers as the modest garden attached to the house would afford on my walk to and from famagusta i was always accompanied by abdul ali and often by one of his brothers a few days after my arrival in famagusta i wrote to sir henry bulwer stating what was my object in desiring to examine the official records concerning the exiles which might be presented at nicosia asking whether i might be permitted to do so and forwarding the letter of recommendation given me by sir robert biddulph in response to my request sir henry bulwer having learnt that the shortness of my stay in the island made it difficult if not impossible for me to visit nicosia was kind enough to forward for my perusal all the more important papers bearing on the subject all of these therefore i was able to examine at my leisure and of all of them with one exception i received permission to make use an abstract of the important facts and dates established by these documents will be found in note w at the end of this book the fifth of april which was the ultimate limit whereunto my stay in cyprus could be protracted unless i were prepared to postpone indefinitely my visit to acre came at last on the morning of that day therefore having with great reluctance bade farewell to all my kind friends i left famagusta and embarked the same afternoon at larnaca on the messagerie steamer gironde i passed a pleasant evening with a turkish official and a syrian who were the only other passengers besides myself and early next morning awoke to find myself at beirut as i had now but two weeks at my disposal ere i must again turn my face homewards i was naturally anxious to proceed as soon as possible to acre especially as i learned that should i fail to find a steamer bound directly for that port three days at least would be consumed by the journey thither it was however necessary for me first to obtain permission from the bobby headquarters 
for though i could without doubt proceed to acre if i so pleased without consulting any one's inclination save my own it was certain that unless my journey had previously received the sanction of baha it would in all probability result in naught but failure and disappointment now there reside at beirut port said and alexandria by one of which places all desirous of proceeding to acre by sea must of necessity pass babis of consequence to whom all desirous of visiting baha must in the first instance apply should such application prove successful the applicant is informed that he may proceed on his journey and receives such instruction advice and assistance as may be necessary to the bobby agent at beirut whose name i do not feel myself at liberty to mention i had a letter of recommendation from one of his relatives with whom i had become acquainted in persia the first thing which i did on my arrival was to send a messenger to discover his abode the messenger shortly returned saying that he had indeed succeeded in finding the place indicated but that the agent was absent from beirut this was a most serious blow to my hopes for time was against me and every day was of vital importance there was nothing for it however but to make the best of the matter and i therefore went in person to the abode of the absent agent and presented myself to his deputy who opened and attentively perused my letter of recommendation and then informed me that his master was at acre and was not expected back for ten days or a fortnight in reply to my anxious inquiries as to how i had best proceed he advised me to write a letter to his master explaining the state of the case which letter together with the letter of recommendation he undertook to forward at once as the post fortunately chanced to be leaving for acre that very evening i at once wrote as he directed and then returned to my lodging with the depressing consciousness that at least five or six days must elapse ere i could receive an answer to my letter or start for acre that even if permission was granted as no steamer appeared likely to be sailing three more days would be spent in reaching my goal and that consequently eight or nine days out of the fourteen still remaining to me would be wasted before i could even set foot in the land of my quest altogether i began to fear that the second part of my journey was likely to prove far less successful than the first fortunately matters turned out much better than i expected in the first place i made the acquaintance of mr eyres the british vice-consul whose kindness and hospitality did much to render my stay at beirut pleasant and who on learning that i wished to proceed to acre told me that he himself intended to start for acre and haifa on the following friday april eleventh and that i might if i pleased accompany him in the second place it occurred to me that i might save two or three days to lay by telegraphing to acre so soon as my letter must in the natural course of things have reached its destination and requesting a telegram in reply to inform me whether i might proceed thither on wednesday april ninth therefore i sent a telegram to this effect on thursday evening returning after sunset to my hotel from a ride in the hills i was met with the welcome news that a persian had called twice to see me during the afternoon stating that he had important business which would not brook delay and that he had left a note for me which i should find upstairs from this note hurriedly scribbled in pencil on a scrap of paper i learned that permission had been granted and that i was free to start as soon as i pleased on receiving this intelligence my first action was to verify it beyond all doubt by calling at once on the deputy of the absent agent whom i fortunately found at home 
he congratulated me warmly on the happy issue of my affairs and handed over to me the original telegram it was laconic in the extreme containing besides the address two words only yet the wed jahul musafir let the traveller approach he then informed me that as no steamer was starting for Accra, i must of necessity proceed thither by land and that the reason why he had been so anxious to communicate with me earlier was that the post left that day at sundown and i might have accompanied it i then told him of mr eyre's kind offer which as we agreed was a most exceptional piece of good fortune for me inasmuch as he proposed to start on the following morning and expected to reach Accra on april thirteenth after bidding farewell to the deputy agent and thanking him for the effectual aid which he had so rendered me i visited mr eyres and told him that i would accept his kind offer if i could obtain a horse and make the necessary arrangements for my journey on the following morning he told me that he must start early but that if i left beirut by midday i could easily overtake him at sidon where he would halt for the night and he further placed at my disposal the services of one of his kawwases to assist me in my preparations next morning friday eleventh i was astir early for there was much to be done with the help of my friend jamaluddin bey of the imperial ottoman bank and the active cooperation of the kawwas of the consulate all was at length satisfactorily arranged and shortly after midday i found myself on a sturdy good-looking but somewhat indolent horse with a khurjin pair of saddle-bags containing the most indispensable of my effects behind me plodding along a sandy road bordered with cactus in the direction of sidon where the road being fortunately easy to follow i arrived without mishap at sundown to speak of the delights of that three days journey the beauty of the scenery the purity and fragrance of the soft spring air the pleasant midday halts by some rippling stream or in some balmy grove and the hospitable receptions accorded to me as mr eyre's travelling companion by those in whose houses we alighted at sidon tyre and acre would be to wander further than is permissible from the subject in hand suffice it to say that thanks to mr eyre's kindness in allowing me to accompany him a journey which if performed in solitude would have lost more than half its charm was rendered enjoyable in the highest degree the last day was perhaps the most delightful of all and i was greatly astonished on entering the acre plain to behold a wealth of beautiful gardens and fragrant orange groves such as i had little expected to find in what baha has stigmatized as quote, the most desolate of countries end quote. Akhrabul Bilad. I subsequently mentioned this feeling of surprise to the Babis at Accra, who replied that had I seen it when Baha first came there nearly two and twenty years ago, I would not have deemed the title misapplied, but that since he had dwelt there, it had assumed this fair and comely aspect. End of Introduction to a Traveller's Narrative by Edward Granville Brown, Part 1. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Introduction to a Traveller's Narrative. Written to illustrate the episode of the Bob. By Edward Granville Brown. Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. We entered Accra, 
towards sundown on april thirteenth and wending our way through the fine bazaars on the smooth stone pavement of which our horses hoofs slipped as on ice alighted at the house of a christian merchant named ebrahim khouri who accorded to us the usual hospitable reception that same evening i sent a note to the bobby agent which was brought back by the messenger unopened with the disagreeable news that my mysterious correspondent had gone to haifa with baha's eldest son abbas effendi this was most unwelcome information for as mr eyres was leaving the next day for haifa and i did not wish to further trespass upon the hospitality of ebrahim khouri it was absolutely essential that i should obtain help from the babis in finding other quarters evidently there was nothing for it but to wait for the morrow and what it might bring forth next morning i inquired if there was any representative of the absent agent who might be cognizant of his movements and was conducted to a shop in the bazaar where i found a tall handsome youth clothed entirely in white save for his red fez from beneath which a mass of glossy black hair swept back behind his ears at the lower level of which it terminated Note concerning the characteristic manner in which the bobbies arrange their hair compare b one pages four ninety nine to five hundred the wearing of pure white garments was from the first another special feature of theirs thus we learn from the tawrikh -e jadid that the defenders of sheikh tabarsi used to issue forth to attack their foes clad in pure white raiment and crying out ya sahib o zaman o lord of the age End note. this youth accosting me in turkish inquired first somewhat haughtily what might be my business i answered him in persian whereat he appeared surprised and after hearing what i had to say bade me follow him he led me to a house situated near the seashore at the door of which we were met by an old persian with long grizzled hair and beard whose scrutinizing gaze was rendered more rather than less formidable by an enormous pair of spectacles this man after conversing for a few moments with my guide in an undertone led me into a large room devoid of all furniture save a sort of bench or divan which ran round its four sides i had scarcely seated myself when another persian evidently superior in authority to the other two entered and saluted me he was a man of middle height and middle age with a keen and not unpleasing countenance whereof the lower part was concealed by a short crisp beard after bidding me reseat myself for i had of course risen on his entrance and ordering his servant for such i discovered was the old man who had met me at the door to give me a cup of coffee he proceeded to subject me to a most minute cross-examination as to my nationality my occupation my travels in persia the object of my present journey and the like my answers appeared to satisfy him and when he had finished his questioning he asked me what i proposed to do i told him that i would be guided entirely by his advice he then asked me whether i would proceed to haifa where i was certain to find the agent whom i sought with baha's son abbas effendi to this i replied that as i had but a few days at my disposal and as acre and not haifa was the goal of my journey i would rather remain than depart in that case said he i myself will go to haifa this afternoon and bring back word to-morrow what you must do meanwhile will you remain where you stayed last night till i return 
i answered that i would rather not trespass further on a hospitality extended to me solely as mr eyre's friend and that if he could suggest any other lodging for that night i should be glad i was not i added exacting in the matter of comfort and would be quite content with a caravanserai he reflected for a few moments and then said very well if that be your wish you can stay here i myself shall be absent but i will give instructions that you shall be looked after and after all it is only for one night to-morrow i shall return and we will if god please find you better quarters when the consul departs for haifa do you also leave the house where you are staying and bring your effects here i then took my leave with many expressions of gratitude and occupied myself during the remainder of the morning in packing my saddle-bags and making arrangements for the stabling of my horse during the time i expected to remain at acre after lunch mr eyres departed for haifa and i quitting ebrahim khouri's abode found some one to carry my effects to the house which i had visited in the morning here i was received by a sharp-looking boy of about fourteen who proved to be the son of my interlocutor of the morning to whom also as i subsequently discovered the house which i had now entered belonged i had expected to receive but the roughest accommodation the resources of the house being in no wise revealed by the room on the ground floor where i had been received in the morning my experience of the hospitality of the persians in general and the babis in particular and the deceptive exteriors of oriental houses might it is true have led me to expect tolerable comfort but could hardly have prepared me for the positive luxury which the thoughtful kindness of my host had provided during the afternoon i was entertained by my host's son who showed that admirable courtesy and savoir faire with which even quite young persian boys are capable in the absence of their elders of receiving the stranger and doing the honours of the house as it was easter monday the street outside was filled with syrian christians who continued so long as daylight lasted to express their joy in howls gunshots and wild dances at which we looked on in amazement from the window a most remarkable and discordant expression of religious fervour it has never been my lot to witness towards the latter part of the afternoon my host's son thinking i suppose that i needed further amusement took me to see an itinerant greek photographer who was temporarily established in a sort of cellar in the basement of the house this greek spoke french tolerably well and seemed an honest kindly fellow he was very anxious to make out that i was a freemason and importuned me greatly to tell him the names of the pillars of solomon's temple dim recollections of some book purporting to expose the secrets of that cult prompted me to seek escape from his pertinacity by suggesting boaz whereupon nothing would serve him but i must tell him the name of the other as i had forgotten this and begun to weary of the subject i took my leave towards evening i received another visitor whose mien and bearing alike marked him as a person of consequence he was a man of perhaps thirty or thirty-five years of age with a face which called to one's mind the finest types of iranian physiognomy preserved to us in the bas reliefs of persepolis yet with something in it beyond this which involuntarily called forth in my mind the thought what would not an artist desirous of painting a saint or an apostle give for such a model my visitor who as i afterwards discovered was a son of baha's deceased brother musa was clothed save for the tall red fez which crowned his head entirely in pure white and everything about him 
from his short well-trimmed beard and the masses of jet-black hair swept boldly behind his ears to the hem of his spotless garment was characterized by the same scrupulous neatness he saluted me very graciously and remained conversing with me all the evening shortly after supper he bade me good night saying that i must doubtless be fatigued with my journey i was then conducted by my host's son and the old servant to the room where i had spent the afternoon where to my astonishment i found that a bed provided with the most efficient mosquito curtains and furnished with fair white sheets and soft mattress had been prepared for me the arrangement of the mosquito curtains called by my new friends namusi was such as i had not previously seen and as it appeared to me perfect in simplicity and efficiency i shall describe it for the benefit of other travellers the namu sea then consists of what may most easily be described as a large box or a small chamber of muslin rectangular in shape greater in length than in breadth and furnished with a single funnel-shaped aperture in one of its sides the muslin chamber is suspended by its corners by cords attached to the wall and is entered through the funnel-shaped aperture the mouth of which is encircled by a cord the bed is laid inside its component parts being introduced one by one the occupant on entering draws tight to the constricting cord and is thereby completely cut off from the attacks of gnats mosquitoes and the like the whole structure can when not in use be folded up in a very small compass i arose next morning tuesday april fourteenth after a most refreshing sleep and was served with tea by the old man with the spectacles soon after this a sudden stir without announced the arrival of fresh visitors and a moment after my companion of the previous evening entered the room accompanied by two other persons one of whom proved to be the bobby agent from beirut while the other as i guessed from the first by the extraordinary deference shown to him by all present was none other than baha's eldest son abbas effendi seldom have i seen one whose appearance impressed me more a tall strongly built man holding himself straight as an arrow with white turban and raiment long black locks reaching almost to the shoulder broad powerful forehead indicating a strong intellect combined with an unswerving will eyes keen as a hawk's and strongly marked but pleasing features such was my first impression of abbas effendi the master Aga, as he par excellence is called by the barbies subsequent conversation with him served only to heighten the respect with which his appearance had from the first inspired me one more eloquent of speech one more ready of argument more apt of illustration more intimately acquainted with the sacred books of the jews the christians and the mohammedans could i should think scarcely be found even amongst the eloquent ready and subtle race to which he belongs these qualities combined with a bearing at once majestic and genial made me cease to wonder at the influence and esteem which he enjoyed even beyond the circle of his father's followers about the greatness of this man and his power no one who had seen him could entertain a doubt in this illustrious company did i partake of the midday meal soon after its conclusion abbas effendi and the others arose with a prefatory bismillah and signified to me that i should accompany them which i did without having any idea whither we were going 
i observed however that the saddle-bags containing my effects were carried after us by one of those present from which i concluded that i was not intended to remain in my present quarters we left the house travelled the bazaars and quitted the town by its solitary gate outside this gate near the sea is a large shed which serves as a coffee-house and here we seated ourselves my companions evidently awaiting the arrival of something or somebody from a large mansion half hidden in a grove of trees situated about a mile or a mile and a half inland towards which they continually directed their glances while we were waiting thus a weird-looking old man who proved to be none other than the famous mushkin qalam note c b one page five sixteen b two page nine ninety four and note w at the end of this book end note came and seated himself beside us he told me that he had heard all about me from a relation of his at esfahan that same dalal who had been the means of my first introduction to the babi community note c b one page four eighty seven and that which follows end note and that he had been expecting to see me at acre ever since that time presently we discerned advancing towards us along the road from the mansion above mentioned three animals one of which was ridden by a man thereupon we arose and went to meet them and i soon found myself mounted on one of those fine white asses which in my opinion are of all quadrupeds the most comfortable to ride a quarter of an hour later we alighted in front of the large mansion aforesaid whereof the name bahji joy is said to be a corruption though as the bobbies do not fail to point out a very happy corruption of baogche which signifies a garden i was almost immediately conducted into a large room on the ground floor where i was most cordially received by several persons whom i had not hitherto seen amongst these were two of baha's younger sons of whom one was apparently about twenty-five and the other about twenty-one years of age both were handsome and distinguished enough in appearance and the expression of the younger was singularly sweet and winning besides these a very old man with light blue eyes and white beard whose green turban proclaimed him a descendant of the prophet advanced to welcome me saying we know not how we should greet thee whether we should greet thee with assalamu alaikum or with allahu abha note that is with the salutation ordinarily used by the mohammedans or with that peculiar to the babis End note. when i discovered that this venerable old man was not only one of the original companions of the bab but his relative and comrade from earliest childhood it may well be imagined with what eagerness i gazed upon him and listened to his every utterance so here at bahji was i installed as a guest in the very midst of all that babism accounts most noble and most holy and here did i spend five most memorable days during which i enjoyed unparalleled and unhoped-for opportunities of holding intercourse with those who are the very fountain-heads of that mighty and wondrous spirit which works with invisible but ever-increasing force for the transformation and quickening of a people who slumber in a sleep like unto death it was in truth a strange and moving experience but one whereof i despair of conveying any save the feeblest impression i might indeed strive to describe in greater detail the faces and forms which surrounded me the conversations to which i was privileged to listen the solemn melodious reading of the sacred books 
the general sense of harmony and content which pervaded the place and the fragrant shady gardens whither in the afternoon we sometimes repaired but all this was as naught in comparison with the spiritual atmosphere with which i was encompassed persian muslims will tell you often that the babis bewitch or drug their guests so that these impelled by a fascination which they cannot resist become similarly affected with what the aforesaid muslims regard as a strange and incomprehensible madness idle and absurd as this belief is it yet rests on a basis of fact stronger than that which supports the greater part of what they allege concerning this people the spirit which pervades the bobbies is such that it can hardly fail to affect most powerfully all subjected to its influence it may appeal or attract it cannot be ignored or disregarded let those who have not seen disbelieve me if they will but should that spirit once reveal itself to them they will experience an emotion which they are not likely to forget of the culminating event of this my journey some few words at least must be said during the morning of the day after my installation at bahji one of baha's younger sons entered the room where i was sitting and beckoned me to follow him i did so and was conducted through passages and rooms at which i scarcely had time to glance to a spacious hall paved so far as i remember for my mind was occupied with other thoughts with a mosaic of marble before a curtain suspended from the wall of this great antechamber my conductor paused for a moment while i removed my shoes then with a quick movement of the hand he withdrew and as i passed replaced the curtain and i found myself in a large apartment along the upper end of which ran a low divan while on the side opposite to the door were placed two or three chairs though i dimly suspected whither i was going and whom i was to behold for no distinct intimation had been given to me a second or two lapsed ere with a throb of wonder and awe i became definitely conscious that the room was not untenanted in the corner where the divan met the wall sat a wondrous and venerable figure crowned with a felt headdress of the kind called tauj by dervishes but of unusual height and make round the base of which was wound a small white turban the face of him on whom i gazed i can never forget though i cannot describe it those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul power and authority sat on that ample brow while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance almost to the waist seemed to belie no need to ask in whose presence i stood as i bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain a mild dignified voice bade me be seated and then continued praise be to god that thou hast attained thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile we desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations yet they deem us a stirrer-up of strife and sedition worthy of bondage and banishment that all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened that diversity of religion should cease 
and differences of race be annulled what harm is there in this yet so it shall be these fruitless strifes these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come do not you in europe need this also is not this that which christ foretold yet do we see your kings and rulers lavishing their treasures more freely on means for the destruction of the human race than on that which would conduce to the happiness of mankind these strifes and this bloodshed and discord must cease and all men be as one kindred and one family let not a man glory in this that he loves his country let him rather glory in this that he loves his kind such so far as i can recall them were the words which besides many others i heard from baha let those who read them consider well with themselves whether such doctrines merit death and bonds and whether the world is more likely to gain or lose by their diffusion my interview lasted altogether about twenty minutes and during the latter part of it baha read a portion of that epistle lo whereof the translation occupies the last paragraph on page seventy and the greater part of page seventy one of this book during the five days spent at bahji tuesday april fifteenth to sunday april twentieth i was admitted to baha's presence four times these interviews always took place an hour or two before noon and lasted from twenty minutes to half an hour one of baha's sons always accompanied me and once aga mirza aga john jinab e khadim allah note c b one page five nineteen and pages three fifty five note two three fifty eight and three sixty to three sixty two infra end note the amanuensis called tebe yalt was also present in their general features these interviews resembled the first of which i have attempted to give a description besides this one afternoon i saw baha walking in one of the gardens which belonged to him he was surrounded by a little group of his chief followers how the journey to and from the garden was accomplished i know not probably under cover of the darkness of night at length the last day to which my departure could possibly be deferred if i were to reach cambridge ere the expiration of my leave arrived loath as i was to go there was no help for it and reluctantly enough i declined the pressing invitations to prolong my stay which the kindness of my friends prompted them to utter finding that i was bent on departure and that i could remain longer without running a great risk of breaking my promise they ceased to try to dissuade me from going and with most considerate kindness strove to make such arrangements for my return journey as might conduce to my comfort in spite of all my assurances that i could easily return by myself it was settled that the bobby agent of beirut should accompany me thither i was very unwilling to put him to such inconvenience but was finally compelled to accede to this arrangement which of course made the return journey far pleasanter than it would otherwise have been in the course of a conversation which took place soon after my arrival i had expressed a strong desire to become better acquainted with the later history of the balbi movement adding that the only history written in a friendly and sympathetic spirit which i had seen was the tariq jadid and that this only carried the narrative down to the year a d eighteen fifty in reply i was told 
that a concise and authentic history carried down almost to the present day had been compiled note for a fuller account of the circumstances which led to the compilation of this history see that portion of note a which is devoted to the tawrikh e jadid pages one ninety four to one ninety five infra end note and that same day this book of which the text and translation are now published was placed in my hands i did not at first understand that this was a gift for many books were lent to me to read in my room and consequently i spent much time which as the event turned out might have been more profitably employed in copying out what i deemed the more important passages of the work in question when at the moment of my departure i offered to return the book i was told that it was a gift which i might take with me in remembrance of my visit whereat i rejoiced greatly besides this i received a fine manuscript copy of the Igon, written by the same scribe the letter zal footnote c note z at end for i had mentioned incidentally that the copy of that work which i had obtained in persia had unfortunately suffered damages which rendered many passages almost illegible at length the moment of departure came and after taking an affectionate farewell of my kind friends i once more turned my face towards beirut i was accompanied by the bobby agent and a servant who left fatherless in childhood by one of the bobby persecutions in persia had since remained in the household of baha went with us as far as tyre i have seldom seen one whose countenance and conversation revealed a more complete contentment with his lot that night we slept in a caravanserai at tyre next day the servant bade us farewell and turned back towards acre while we continued on our way and shortly after sunset passed through the beautiful gardens which surround sidon that fairest and most fragrant of syria's cities here we alighted at the house of a babi of yazd whose kindly hospitality formed a pleasant contrast to our somewhat dreary lodgings the previous night on the evening of the following day tuesday april twenty second we entered beirut and halted for a while to rest and refresh ourselves with tea at the house of a babi of baghdad which was situated in the outskirts of the town this man had as a child gone with his father to persia in the hope of seeing the bob this he was unable to do the bob being at the time confined in the fortress of chehrik but at tehran he had seen mulla hussein of bushraway i asked him what manner of man mulla hussein was lean and fragile to look at he answered but keen and bright as the sword which never left his side for the rest he was not more than thirty or thirty-five years old and his raiment was white next day soon after sundown the last farewell said and the precious manuscripts carefully concealed about me i was borne swiftly out of beirut harbour by the egyptian steamer Rohmaniya. eight days later on thursday may first i was back in cambridge so ended a most interesting most successful and most pleasant journey shortly after my return to cambridge i addressed a note to the syndicate of the university press stating in brief outline the course and results of the investigations which had occupied me during the last three years and my desire to place before the world some portion of these results by publishing the text and translation of one or other of the two bobby histories which i had obtained of these two histories i briefly discussed the respective merits adding that although the text of the tawrikh e jadid only awaited collation with the british museum manuscript while the translation thereof was far advanced towards completion this newer history owing to its comparatively small bulk could probably be got ready for publication quite as soon as the larger work while the manuscript of it which i had obtained being accurate well written 
and to the best of my knowledge unique in europe might with perfect propriety be reproduced in facsimile by some process of photolithography in reply to my application i was presently informed that the syndicate was prepared to accept and publish the smaller work so soon as it should be ready while the expediency of publishing the larger tawrikh -e jadid was deferred for further consideration on learning the favourable result of my application i at once applied myself vigorously to the work of translation and annotation and by the end of july eighteen ninety the first proof-sheets were already before me as it had been decided that the text should be reproduced by photolithography i had no anxiety on that score and the excellence of the facsimile produced in the workshops of the cambridge engraving company under the careful supervision of mr jew smith of trinity college will i am confident more than reconcile the persian scholar to the necessity of dealing with a lithographed instead of a printed text it remains for me to speak briefly of the peculiarities of this history both as regards tone and style as to the former the chief features which will strike the attentive reader are one the quite secondary importance accorded to the bob whose mission is throughout depicted as a mere preparation for the fuller and more perfect dispensation of baha in like manner the deeds and sufferings of the early apostles of Babism are passed over very lightly and many of the most remarkable events of the older dispensation such as the deaths of the seven martyrs note c note b at end end note and the great massacre at tehran in eighteen fifty two which renan note les apotres page three seventy eight see also note t at end end note calls un jour sans pareil peut-être dans l'histoire du monde are almost or quite unnoticed the martyrdoms of mirza badi note see pages one o two to one o six infra end note and the two seyeds of esfahan note see pages one sixty seven to one sixty nine and four hundred and that which follows infra and b one pages four eighty nine to four ninety one end note which belong to the new dispensation are on the other hand treated of very fully two mirza yahya subh azal is throughout depicted as a person of no consequence enjoying for a while a merely nominal supremacy bestowed upon him not for any special merit or capacity but out of regard for certain considerations of expediency note compare pages sixty two to sixty three infra end note no opportunity is lost of disparaging both his courage and his judgment note compare pages fifty one to fifty two sixty three to sixty four eighty nine to ninety and ninety three to one o one infra end note and of contrasting him in these respects with baha who is everywhere described as the true and legitimate chief three towards the shah of persia an extraordinarily temperate tone is observed and in several places apologies are put forward for his justification the blame for the cruelties inflicted on the babis being thrown either on his ministers and courtiers or on the mohammedan doctors who are repeatedly and strongly denounced note compare pages twenty thirty two to thirty three thirty four to thirty five forty to forty one fifty two and one o four to one o six infra end note four the resistance opposed to the government by the earlier babis is deprecated even when evoked by the most wanton acts of aggression and cruelty note compare page thirty five infra end note the attempt on the shah's life in particular being alluded to with the utmost horror note see pages forty nine to fifty one infra end note and it is implied that although the bob's precepts were altogether those of peace the stronger will and influence of baha were needed to give them actual currency 
Note, compare pages 65 to 69, infra, end note. The chief peculiarities presented by the style of this work are as follows. 1. A remarkable terseness and concision, rare in Persian. 2. An unusual preponderance of the Arabic element, and the frequent employment of many uncommon Arabic words. 3. An abundant use of the past participle, in place of the past tense, where we should expect the latter. A good instance of this peculiarity occurs in the first five lines of page three of the text. Of these three peculiarities, the second and third are noticed by Gobineau. Religions et philosophie, page 312, as characteristic of the Bobby style in general. He says, C'est un persan où il ne paraît presque que des mots arabes choisi parmi les plus relevés et les plus rares et où se combinent les formes grammaticales des deux langues de manière à exercer singulièrement la sagacité et il faut le dire aussi la patience des lecteurs dévots et confiants suivant un usage qui est du reste assez reçu dans les ouvrages philosophiques les verbes persans employés se présentent presque toujours sous la forme concrète de participes passés afin de ressembler autant que possible à des verbes arabes. 4. A very noticeable tendency to omit the Persian auxiliary verb after Arabic participles, whether active or passive, and generally speaking, to restrict the employment of the verb as much as possible. The following instances and the like will be found almost on every page, will suffice to illustrate this feature. On page one, last line, and page two, first line, Chon in ravoyot imuchtalefe dar soyer orog mazkur vabayonash sababe tatvil elach. Now, since these various accounts are recorded in other pages, and since the setting forth thereof would be the cause of prolixity, therefore, etc. On page 39, last line, and page 40, first line, Bori iran dar in bohran, va olamoye et lome heiran o parishan, ke chogone magfur Muhammad shah, Marhum shod. Well, Persia was in this critical state, and the learned doctors perplexed and anxious, when the late Prince Mohammed Shah died. On page 43, last line, and page 44, first three lines, Tasavoro afkorashon begarore sobeb vasoluko raftorashon barhespekadim motobeb Tariq vosul bebob niz mastud, va au tashe fetne as har jahat shot levaro mashhud. Their conceptions and ideas were after the former fashion, and their conduct and behavior in correspondence with ancient usage. The way of approach to the bob was, moreover, closed, and the flame of trouble visibly blazing on every side five two peculiar idioms common to all bobby compositions remain to be noticed the first of these is the continual use of cheke in the sense of four to the almost complete exclusion of ziroke cheroke or the simple che which are commonly employed in other works the second is the combination of the past and the present, or the past and future tenses, in general assertions, an idiom which is even more common in the writings of the Bob than in those of Baha. Of this usage, the following instances may be cited from the present work. At the bottom of page 141, Cheke on Sultan Ebi Mesol. Lo zola mokadas as soudo no zulbude 
و خواهد بود for that peerless king hath been and will be for everlasting holy above ascent or descent in the sentence at the top of page 142 which follows the above pass ma'niya nusrat al yom e'teraz bar ahadi mujadale ba nafsi nabude va nakhahad bud therefore today victory neither hath been nor will be interference with any one nor strife with any person the peculiarities of style affected by the bob have for the most part received the sanction of baha and are copied with greater or less fidelity by the majority of babis so that one familiar with them might often succeed in recognizing a letter or other document as of babi authorship it remains for me to say a few words as to the principles which have guided me in my own work namely the translation and notes as regards the former i have taken as my guide the canon laid down by the late dr william wright whose death mourned by all as an irreparable loss was to such as were like myself privileged to listen to his teaching and feel the genial influence of his constant and unvarying kindness and encouragement the saddest of bereavements this canon he states as follows chronicle of joshua the stylite cambridge eighteen eighty two pages six to seven of the preface Quote, in my translation i have striven to be as literal as the difference between the two idioms will allow my method is first to translate as closely as i can and then to try if i can improve the form of expression in any way without the sacrifice of truthfulness to the original i also endeavour to preserve a somewhat antiquated and biblical style as being peculiarly adapted to the rendering into english of oriental works whether poetical or historical the old testament and the quran which are of course in many ways strikingly similar in their diction can both be easily made ridiculous by turning them into our modern vernacular particularly if we vulgarize with malice prepense End quote now though i cannot flatter myself that i have succeeded in making my translation of this history very eloquent english i can at least conscientiously declare that i have spared no pains to reproduce faithfully not only the thought but also the style and diction of my author the desire to give a correct impression of the original has even led me to preserve the persian idiom where a slight alteration would have improved the english an instance of this occurs in the very first sentence on page one where on the lips would undoubtedly have been better english than on the tongues throughout my translation i have unhesitatingly preferred fidelity to elegance and even if i have gone too far in this i trust that at least the english reader will obtain a clearer idea of the peculiarities of the original than would otherwise have been possible words of constant recurrence have been so far as possible rendered by the same english equivalent which according to the canon above referred to often bears the meaning which it has in the bible rather than that which is given to it in ordinary usage thus by lawyers fogaha are intended the expounders of the sacred books and of the law therein contained and by doctors ulama those learned in theology and the kindred sciences as regards the notes with which i have endeavoured to elucidate control and amplify the text they are of two kinds footnotes containing explanations necessary for the proper comprehension of the text references supplementary details or varying traditions of events recorded in the body of the work brief notices of events intentionally or accidentally passed over comments and the like 
and the final notes designated by capital letters to which perhaps the term excursus or appendix might more fitly have been given these latter have i confess grown to proportions far exceeding what i originally intended for the printing of the translation was finished ere half of them were written and ever as i wrote fresh scraps of information which i could not persuade myself to omit kept coming in i cannot but feel that partly in consequence of this partly because of the very nature of my original plan portions of my work will appear discursive desultory and disconnected even if it be free which i can scarcely hope from contradictions and repetitions but my aim and object has been chiefly to record for the benefit of future historians every fact which i have been able to learn and every varying tradition which i have heard in persia turkey syria or cyprus in the case of divergent traditions i have so far as was consistent with the safety of my informants given the isned or chain of authorities by which they reached me when this could not be done i have striven to give the reader some means of forming an estimate of the character of my informant the office of the chronicler and collector of traditions is in comparison with that of the historian a humble one yet the labours of the former are indispensable to those of the latter and must precede them the immense superiority of tobari to all other oriental historians lies as professor nuldica observes in this that he was content to record the various traditions of diverse events which he learned from this one or that one without seeking prematurely to blend them into one harmonious narrative let the oldest traditions of any historical event once be gathered up the credibility of their narrators being as far as possible determined and the chronicle may without prejudice to itself await in patience for centuries if need be the magic touch of the true historian but if once the old traditions be lost the loss can never be made good through a fortunate combination of circumstances unlikely to repeat itself i was placed in a singularly good position for gathering together bobby traditions from sources many of which will in a few years be no longer available and i was impatient to place on record the mass of information thus arduously acquired so that now as i write the last page of this work i am conscious of a deep sense of relief and thankfulness that no obstacle has intervened to prevent the conclusion of my labours of the bibliography of barbeism a full account will be found in note a at the end of the book so that i need add nothing further on this subject my first and second articles on the barbies in the j r a s for eighteen eighty nine volume twenty one new series parts three and four are as already explained respectively denoted throughout this work as b one and b two when gobineau is quoted his work les religions et les philosophies dans l'asie centrale second edition paris eighteen eighty six is referred to unless otherwise specified mirza kazem begs five articles on the barbies in the journal asiatique though all published in eighteen eighty six extend through two volumes of that periodical each of which volumes has a separate pagination for convenience and brevity therefore the first and second of these articles included in volume set sixième série of the journal asiatique are together denoted as cosenbeg one while the third fourth and fifth contained in volume eight are called cosenbeg two any other works whereof the full titles are not given in the notes will be found described in detail in note a concerning the facsimile of the text some few words are necessary thanks to the careful supervision of mr a g jew smith of trinity college for whose sympathetic and cordial cooperation i desire to express my warm gratitude 
this leaves little to be desired reproducing faithfully the features of the original manuscript in spite of all care however the reproduction of a letter or word here and there would in the first instance prove defective while now and then points and dots not belonging to the original would creep in most of these defects have i hope been removed every page having been subjected two or three times to a careful scrutiny during this revision the original manuscript was always before me and only when it appeared that a defect observed in the proof already existed there has it been left untouched in a word so far as the text is concerned the object has been to reproduce not to correct or amend from this general rule however i have been compelled to deviate in certain special cases throughout the original manuscript a somewhat erratic system of punctuation by means of red dots prevails these red dots necessarily appeared as black dots in the facsimile now and then it happened that owing to their situation they came to simulate diacritical points thus creating a confusion ambiguity or unsightliness which was foreign to the original manuscript in such cases i have considered myself justified in removing these marks of punctuation but so far as possible they have been allowed to stand the persian title page does not belong to the original but was subsequently written at acre by my request in black and beautifully reproduced in colours by mr jew smith an investigation such as that whereof the course has been above detailed can be brought to a successful issue only by the cooperation and assistance of many persons without whose kindly aid the desired information could not be obtained to each and all of those to whose aid i am thus indebted i have striven even at the risk of repetition to express my indebtedness as occasion arose it only remains for me to tender my most sincere thanks to such of my friends as have assisted me in the actual preparation of the work in the tedious work of revising the proof sheets i have received most efficient and valuable help from mr r a neal of this college to the kindness and learning of professor robertson smith of christ's college and mr a a bevan of trinity college i am indebted for many suggestions and corrections to the rare generosity of baron victor rosen of st petersburg in allowing me to make full and free use of still unpublished work i have had occasion to refer repeatedly in the course of my notes lastly i desire to express my gratitude to the syndics of the university press for that liberal assistance without which the publication of this work might have been indefinitely postponed End of Introduction to a Traveller's Narrative Written to illustrate the episode of the Bob by Edward Granville Brown Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater Recorded in London, England The Life of Buddha and Its Lessons by H. S. Olcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Buddha and Its Lessons. The thoughtful student, in scanning the religious history of the race, has one fact continually forced upon his notice, viz., that there is an invariable tendency to deify whomsoever shows himself superior to the weakness of our common humanity. Look where we will, we find the saint-like man exalted into a divine personage and worshipped for a god. Though perhaps misunderstood, reviled, and even persecuted while living, the apothesis is almost sure to come true after death and the victim of yesterday's mob raised to the state of an intercessor in heaven is besought with prayer and tears and placatory penances to mediate with god for the pardon of human sin this is a mean and vile trait of human nature the proof of ignorance selfishness 
brutal cowardice and a superstitious materialism it shows the base instinct to put down and destroy whatever or whoever makes men feel their own imperfections with the alternative of ignoring and denying these very imperfections by turning into gods men who have merely spiritualized their natures so that it may be supposed that they were heavenly incarnations and not mortal like other men this process of euhemerization as it is called or the making of men into gods and gods into men sometimes though more rarely begins during the life of the hero but usually after death the true history of his life is gradually amplified and decorated with fanciful incidents to fit into the new character which has been posthumously given him omens and portents are now made available to his earthly avatar his porosity is described as superhuman as a babe or lisping child he silences the wisest logicians by his divine knowledge miracles he produces as other boys do soap bubbles the terrible energies of nature are his playthings the gods angels and demons are his habitual attendants the sun moon and all the starry host wheel around his cradle in joyful measures and the earth thrills with joy at having borne such a prodigy and at his last hour of mortal life the whole universe shakes with conflicting emotions why need i use the few moments at my disposal to marshal before you the various personages of whom these fables have been written let it suffice to recall the interesting fact to your notice and invite you to compare the respective biographies of the brahmanical krishna the persian zarasta the egyptian hermes the indian guatama and the canonical especially the apocryphal jesus taking krishna or zarasta as you please as the most ancient and coming down the chronological line of descent you will find them all made after the same pattern the real personage is all covered up and concealed under the embroidered veils of the romancer and the enthusiastic histographer what is surprising to me is that this tendency to exaggeration and hyperbole is not more commonly allowed for by those who in our days attempt to discuss and compare religions we are constantly and painfully reminded that the prejudice of inimical critics on the one hand and the furious bigotry of devotees on the other blind men to fact and probability and lead to gross injustice let me take as an example the mythical biographies of jesus at the time when the council of nicaea was convened for settling the quarrels of certain bishops and for the purpose of examining into the canonicity of the three hundred more or less apocryphal gospels that were being read in the christian churches as inspired writings the history of the life of christ had reached the height of absurd myth we may see some specimens in the extant books of the apocryphal new testament but most of them are now lost what have been retained in the present canon may doubtless be regarded as the least objectionable and yet we must not hastily adopt even this conclusion for you know that sabina bishop of heratia himself speaking of the council of nicaea affirms that except constantine and sabinus bishop of pamphilius these bishops were a set of illiterate simple creatures that understood nothing which is as though he had said they were a pack of fools and pappus in his sonidicon to that council of nicaea lets us into the secret that the canon was not decided by a careful comparison of several gospels before them but by a lottery having he tells us promiscuously put all the books that were referred to the council for determination under a communion table in a church they the bishops besought the lord that the inspired writings might get up on the table while the spurious writings remained underneath it and it happened accordingly but letting all this pass and looking only at what is contained in the present canon we see that the same tendency to compel all nature to attest the diversity of the writer's hero at the nativity a star leaves its orbit and leads the persian astrologers to the divine child and angels come and converse with shepherds and a whole train of like celestial phenomena occurs at various stages of his earthly career which closes amid earthquakes a pall of darkness over the whole scene a supernatural war of the elements the opening of graves and the walking about of their tenants and other appalling wonders now if the candid buddhist concedes that the real history of Gautama is embellished by like absurd exaggerations and if we can find their duplicates in the biographies of zarasta shankaracharya and other real personages of antiquity have we not the right to conclude that the true history of the founder of christianity if at this late date it were possible to write it would be very different from the narratives that pass current 
we must not forget that jerusalem was at that time a roman dependency just as ceylon is now a british and that the silence of contemporary roman historians about any such violent disturbances of the equilibrium of nature is deeply significant i have cited this example for the sole and simple purpose of bringing home to the non-buddhistic portion of my present audience the conviction that in considering the life of sakya muni and the lessons it teaches they must not make his followers of to-day responsible for any extravagant exuberances of past biographers the doctrine of buddha and its effects are to be judged quite apart from the man just as the doctrine ascribed to jesus and its effects are to be considered quite irrespectively of his personal history and as i hope i have shown the actual doings and sayings of every founder of a faith or a school of philosophy must be sought for under a heap of tinsel and rubbish contributed by successive generations of followers approaching the question of the hour in this spirit of precaution what do we find are the probabilities respecting the life of sakya muni who was he when did he live how did he live what did he teach a most careful comparison of authorities and analysis of evidence establishes i think the following data one he was the son of a king two he lived between six and seven centuries before christ three he resigned his royal state and went to live in the jungle and among the lowest and most unhappy classes so as to learn the secret of human pain and misery by personal experience tested every known austerity of the hindu aesthetics and excelled them all in his power of endurance sounded every depth of woe in search of the means to alleviate it and at last came out victorious and showed the world the way to salvation four what he taught may be summed up in a few words as the perfume of many roses may be distilled into a few drops of attar everything in the world of matter is unreal the only reality is in the world of spirit emancipate yourselves from the tyranny of the former strive to attain the latter the rev samuel beale in his catena of buddhist scriptures from the chinese puts it differently the idea underlying the buddhist religious system is he says simply this all is vanity earth is a show and heaven is a vain reward primitive buddhism was engrossed absorbed by one thought the vanity of finite existence the priceless value of the one condition of eternal rest if i have the temerity to prefer my own definition of the spirit of buddha's doctrine it is because i think that all the misconceptions of it have arisen from a failure to understand his idea of what is real and what is unreal what worth longing and striving for and what not from this misconception have come all the unfounded charges that buddhism is an atheistical that is to say a grossly materialistic a nihilistic a negative a vice-breeding religion buddhism denies the existence of a personal god true therefore well therefore and notwithstanding all this its teaching is neither what may be called properly atheistical nihilistic negative nor provocative of vice i will try to make my meaning clear and the advancement of modern scientific research helps in this direction science divides the universe for us into two elements matter and force accounting for their phenomena by their combinations and making both eternal and obedient to eternal and immutable law the speculations of men of science have carried them to the outermost verge of the physical universe behind them lie not only a thousand brilliant triumphs by which a part of nature's secrets have been wrung from her but also more thousands of failures to fathom her deep mysteries they have proved thought material since it is the evolution of the grey tissue of the brain and a recent german experimentalist professor dr jaeger claims to have proved that man's soul is a volatile odiferous principle capable of solution in glycerine psychogen is the name he gives to it and his experiments show that it is present not merely in the body as a whole but in every individual cell in the ovum and even in the ultimate elements of protoplasm i need hardly say to so intelligent an audience as this that these highly interesting experiments of dr jaeger are corroborated by many facts both physiological and psychological that have been always noticed amongst all nations facts which are woven into popular proverbs legends folklore fables mythologies and theologies the world over now 
if thought is matter and soul is matter then buddha in recognizing the impermanence of sensual enjoyment or experience of any kind and the instability of every material form the human soul included uttered a profound and scientific truth and since the very idea of gratification or suffering is inseparable from that of material being absolute spirit alone being regarded by common consent as perfect changeless and eternal therefore in teaching the doctrine that conquest of the material self with all its lusts desires loves hopes ambitions and hates frees one from pain and leads to nirvana the state of perfect rest he preached the rest of an untinged untainted existence in the spirit though the soul be composed of the finest conceivable substance yet if substance at all as dr jaeger seems able to prove and ages of human intercourse with the weird phantoms of the shadow world imply it must in time perish what remains is that changeless part of man which most philosophers call spirit and nirvana is its necessary condition of existence the only dispute between buddhist authorities is whether the nirvanic existence is attended with individual consciousness or whether the individual is merged in the whole as the extinguished flame is lost in the air but there are those who say that the flame has not been annihilated by the blowing out it has only passed out of the visible world of matter into the invisible world of spirit where it still exists and will ever exist as a bright reality such thinkers can understand buddha's doctrine while agreeing with him that soul is not immortal would spurn the change of materialistic nihilism if brought against either that sublime teacher or themselves the history of sakya muni's life is the strongest bullock of his religion as long as the human heart is capable of being touched by tales of heroic self-sacrifice accompanied by purity and celestial benevolence of motive it will cherish his memory why should i go into the particulars of that noble life you will remember that he was the son of kapilavstu a mighty sovereign whose opulence enabled him to give the heir of his house every luxury that a voluptuous imagination could desire and that the future buddha was not allowed even to know much less observe the miseries of ordinary existence how beautifully edwin arnold has painted for us in the light of asia the luxury and languor of that indian court where love was jailer and delights its bars we are told that quote, the king commanded that within those walls no mention should be made of age or death sorrow or pain or sickness and every dawn the dying rose was plucked the dead leaves hid all evil slights removed for said the king if he shall pass his youth far from such things as move to wistfulness and brooding on the empty eggs of thought the shadow of this fate too vast for man may fade belike and i shall see him grow to that great stature of fair sovereignty when he shall rule all lands if he will rule the king of kings and glory of his time you know how vain were all the precautions taken by the father to prevent the fulfilment of the prophecy that his beloved son would be the coming buddha though all suggestions of death were banished from the royal palace though the city was bedecked with flowers and gay flags and every painful object removed from sight when the young prince siddhartha visited it yet the decrees of destiny were not to be baffled the voices of the spirits the wandering winds and the devas whispered the truth of human sorrows into his listening ear and when the appointed hour arrived the sudha devas threw the spell of slumber over the household steeped in profound lethargy the sentinels as we are told was done by an angel to the jailers of peter's prison rolled back the triple gates of bronze strewed the sweet mogra flowers thickly beneath the horse's feet to muffle every sound and he was free free yes to resign every earthly comfort every sensuous enjoyment the sweets of royal power the homage of a court the delights of domestic life gems the glitter of gold rich stuffs rich food soft beds the song of trained musicians and of birds kept prisoner in gay cages the murmur of perfumed waters splashing in marbled basins the delicious shade of trees and gardens where art had contrived to make even nature lovelier than herself he leaps from his saddle when at a safe distance from the palace flings the jewelled rein to his fathomed groom chana cuts off his flowing locks gives his rich costume to a hunter in exchange for his own 
plunges into the jungle and is free Quote, to tread its paths with patient stainless feet making its dusty bed its loneliest wastes my dwelling and its meanest things my mates clad in no prouder garb than outcasts wear fed with no meals save what the charitable give of their will sheltered by no more pomp than the dim cave lens or the jungle bush this will i do because the woeful cry of life and all flesh living cometh up into my ears and all my soul is full of pity for the sickness of this world which i will heal if healing may be found by uttermost renouncing and strong strife thus masterfully does sir edwin arnold depict the sentiment which provoked this great renunciator the testimony of thousands of millions who during the last twenty-five centuries have professed the buddhistic religion proves that the secret of human misery was at last solved by this divine self-sacrifice and the true path to nirvana opened the joy that he brought to the hearts of others buddha first tasted himself he found that the pleasures of the eye the ear the taste touch and smell are fleeting and deceptive he who gives value to them brings only disappointment and bitter sorrow upon himself the social differences between men he found were equally arbitrary and elusive caste bred hatred and selfishness riches strife envy and malice so in founding his faith he laid the bottom of its foundation stones upon all this worldly dirt and its dome in the clear serene of the world of spirit he who can mount to a clear conception of nirvana will find his thought far away above the common joys and sorrows of petty men as to one who ascends the top of chimborazo or the himalayan crags and sees men on the earth's surface crawling to and fro like ants so equally small do bigots and sectarians appear to him the mountain climber has under his feet the very clouds from whose sun-painted shapes the poet has figured to himself the golden streets and glittering domes of the materialistic heaven of a personal god below him are all the various objects out of which the world's pantheons have been manufactured around above immensity and so also far down the ascending plane of thought that leads from the earth towards the infinite the philosophic buddhist describes at different plateaux the heaven and hells the gods and demons of the materialistic creed builders what are the lessons to be derived from the life and teachings of this heroic prince of kapilavstu lessons of gratitude and benevolence lessons of tolerance for the clashing opinions of men who live move and have their being think and aspire only in the materialistic world the lesson of a common tie of brotherhood among all men lessons of manly self-reliance of equanimity in breasting whatsoever of good or ill may happen lessons of the meanness of the rewards the pettiness of the misfortunes of a shifting world of illusions lessons of the necessity for avoiding every species of evil thought and word and for doing speaking and thinking everything that is good and from the bringing of the mind into subjection so that these may be accomplished without selfish motive or vanity lessons of self-purification and communion by which the elusiveness of externals and the values of internals are understood well might st hilaire burst into the panegyric that buddha is the perfect model of all the virtues he preaches his life has not a stain upon it well might the sober critic max muller pronounce his moral code one of the most perfect which the world has ever known no wonder that in contemplating that gentle life edwin arnold should have found his personality the highest gentlest holiest and most beneficent in the history of thought and been moved to write his splendid verses it is twenty-five hundred years since humanity put forth such a flower who knows when it did before gautama buddha sakya muni has ennobled the whole human race his fame is our common inheritance his law is the law of justice providing for every good thought word and deed its fair reward for every evil one its proper punishment his law is in harmony with the voices of nature and the evident equilibrium of the universe it yields nothing to importunities or threats can be neither coaxed nor bribed by offerings to abate or alter one jot or tittle of inexorable course 
am i told that buddhist laymen display vanity in their worship and ostentation in their almsgiving that they are fostering sects as bitterly as hindus so much the worse for the layman there is the example of the buddha and his law am i told that buddhist priests are ignorant idle fosterers of superstitions grafted on their religion by foreign kings so much the worse for the priests the life of their divine master shames them and shows their unworthiness to wear his yellow robe or carry his beggar's bowl there is the law immutable menacing it will find them out and punish and what shall we say to those of another cast of character the humble-minded charitable tolerant religiously aspiring hearts among the laity and the unselfish pure and learned of the priests who know the precepts and keep them the law will find them out also and when the book of each life is written up and the balance struck every good thought or deed will be found entered in its proper place not one blessing that ever followed them from grateful lips throughout their earthly pilgrimage will be found to have been lost but each will help to ease their ways as they move from stage to stage of being unto nirvana where the silence lives end of the life of buddha and its lessons by h s alcott read by john fricker the locomotive chase in georgia by william pittenger this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the railroad raid to georgia in the spring of eighteen sixty two has always been considered to rank high among the striking and novel incidents of the civil war at that time general o m mitchell under whose authority it was organized commanded union forces in middle tennessee consisting of a division of buell's army the confederates were concentrating at corinth mississippi and grant and buell were advancing by different routes toward that point mitchell's orders required him to protect nashville and the country around but allowed him great latitude in the disposition of his division which with detachments and garrisons numbered nearly seventeen thousand men his attention had long been strongly turned toward the liberation of east tennessee which he knew that president lincoln also earnestly desired and which would if achieved strike a most damaging blow at the resources of the rebellion a union army once in possession of east tennessee would have the inestimable advantage found nowhere else in the south of operating in the midst of a friendly population and having at hand abundant supplies of all kinds mitchell had no reason to believe that corinth would detain the union armies much longer than fort donelson had done and was satisfied that as soon as that position had been captured the next movement would be eastward toward chattanooga thus throwing his own division in advance he determined therefore to press into the heart of the enemy's country as far as possible occupying strategical points before they were adequately defended and assured of speedy and powerful reinforcement to this end his measures were vigorous and well chosen on the eighth of april eighteen sixty two the day after the battle of pittsburg landing of which however mitchell had received no intelligence he marched swiftly southward from shelbyville and seized huntsville in alabama on the eleventh of april and then sent a detachment westward over the memphis and charleston railroad to open railway communication with the union army at pittsburgh landing another detachment commanded by mitchell in person advanced on the same day seventy miles by rail directly into the enemy's territory arriving unchecked with two thousand men within thirty miles of chattanooga in two hours time he could now reach that point the most important position in the west why did he not go on the story of the railroad raid is the answer the night before breaking camp at shelbyville mitchell sent an expedition secretly into the heart of georgia to cut the railroad communications of chattanooga to the south and east the fortune of this attempt had a most important bearing upon his movements and will now be narrated 
In the employ of General Buell was a spy named James J. Andrews, who had rendered valuable services in the first year of the war, and had secured the full confidence of the Union commanders. In March 1862, Buell had sent him secretly with eight men to burn the bridges west of Chattanooga. But the failure of expected cooperation defeated the plan, and Andrews, after visiting Atlanta, and inspecting the whole of the enemy's lines in that vicinity and northward, had returned, ambitious to make another attempt. His plans for the second raid were submitted to Mitchell, and on the eve of the movement from Shelbyville to Huntsville, Mitchell authorized him to take twenty-four men, secretly enter the enemy's territory, and by means of capturing a train, burn the bridges on the northern part of the Georgia State Railroad, and also one on the East Tennessee Railroad, where it approaches the Georgia State Line, thus completely isolating Chattanooga, which was virtually ungarrisoned. The soldiers for this expedition, of whom the writer was one, were selected from three Ohio regiments belonging to General J. W. Sill's brigade, being simply told that they were wanted for a secret and very dangerous service. So far as known, not a man chosen declined the perilous honor. Our uniforms were exchanged for ordinary southern dress, and all arms except revolvers were left in camp. On the 7th of April, by the roadside about a mile east of Shelbyville, in the late evening twilight, we met our leader. Taking us a little way from the road, he quietly placed before us the outlines of the romantic and adventurous plan, which was to break into small detachments of three or four, journey eastward into the Cumberland Mountains, then work southward, traveling by rail, after we were well within the Confederate lines, and finally the evening of the third day after the start meet Andrews at Marietta, Georgia, more than two hundred miles away. When questioned, we were to profess ourselves Kentuckians going to join the Southern Army. On the journey we were a good deal annoyed by the swollen streams and the muddy roads consequent on three days of almost ceaseless rain. Andrews was led to believe that Mitchell's column would be inevitably delayed, and as we were expected to destroy the bridges the very day that Huntsville was entered, he took the responsibility of sending word to our different groups that our attempt would be postponed one day, from Friday to Saturday, April 12th. This was a natural, but a most lamentable, error of judgment. One of the men detailed was belated, and did not join us at all. Two others were very soon captured by the enemy, and though their true character was not detected, they were forced into the southern army, and two reached Marietta, but failed to report at the rendezvous. Thus, when we assembled very early in the morning in Andrew's room at the Marietta Hotel, for final consultation before the blow was struck, we were but twenty, including our leader. All preliminary difficulties had been easily overcome, and we were in good spirits, but some serious obstacles had been revealed in our ride from Chattanooga to Marietta the previous evening. The railroad was found to be crowded with trains, and many soldiers were among the passengers. Then the station, Big Shanty, at which the capture was to be effected, had recently been made a Confederate camp. To succeed in our enterprise, it would be necessary first to capture the engine in a guarded camp, with soldiers standing around as spectators, and then to run it from one to two hundred miles through the enemy's country, and to deceive or overpower all trains that should be met, a large contract for twenty men. Some of our party thought the chances of success so slight under existing circumstances that they urged the abandonment of the whole enterprise. But Andrews declared his purpose to succeed or die, offering to each man, however, the privilege of withdrawing from the attempt, an offer no one was in the least disposed to accept. Final instructions were then given, and we hurried to the ticket office in time for the northward-bound mail train, and purchased tickets for different stations along the line in the direction of Chattanooga. Our ride as passengers was but eight miles. We swept swiftly around the base of Kennesaw Mountain, and soon saw the tents of the Confederate forces, camped at Big Shanty, gleam white in the morning mist. Here we were to stop for breakfast, and attempt the seizure of the train. 
the morning was raw and gloomy and a rain which fell all day had already begun it was a painfully thrilling moment we were but twenty with an army about us and a long and difficult road before us crowded with enemies in an instant we were to throw off the disguise which had been our only protection, and trust to our leader's genius and our own efforts for safety and success. Fortunately, we had no time for giving way to reflections and conjectures which could only unfit us for the stern task ahead. When we stopped, the conductor, the engineer, and many of the passengers hurried to breakfast, leaving the train unguarded. Now was the moment of action ascertaining that there was nothing to prevent a rapid start andrews our two engineers brown and knight and the firemen hurried forward uncoupling a section of the train consisting of three empty baggage or box cars the locomotive and the tender the engineers and the firemen sprang into the cab of the engine while andrews with hand on the rail and foot on the step waited to see that the remainder of the party had gained entrance into the rear box car this seemed difficult and slow, though it really consumed but a few seconds, for the car stood on a considerable bank, and the first who came were pitched in by their comrades, while these in turn dragged in the others, and the door was instantly closed. A sentinel, with musket in hand, stood not a dozen feet from the engine, watching the whole proceeding, but before he, or any of the soldiers or guards around, could make up their minds to interfere, all was done and Andrews, with a nod to his engineer, stepped on board. The valve was pulled wide open, and for a moment the wheels slipped round in rapid, ineffective revolutions. Then with a bound that jerked the soldiers in the box-car from their feet, the little train darted away, leaving the camp and the station in the wildest uproar and confusion. The first step of the enterprise was triumphantly accomplished. According to the timetable, of which Andrews had secured a copy, there were two trains to be met. These presented no serious hindrance to our attaining high speed, for we could tell just where to expect them. There was also a local freight not down on the timetable, but which could not be far distant. Any danger of collision with it could be avoided by running according to the schedule of the captured train until it was passed. Then at the highest possible speed we could run to the Ustanala and Chickamauga bridges, lay them in ashes, and pass on through Chattanooga to Mitchell at Huntsville, or wherever eastward of that point he might be found, arriving long before the close of the day. It was a brilliant prospect, and so far as human estimates can determine, it would have been realized had the day been Friday instead of Saturday. Friday every train had been on time, the day dry, the road in perfect order. Now the road was in disorder, every train far behind time, and two extras were approaching us. But of these unfavorable conditions we knew nothing, and pressed confidently forward. We stopped frequently, and at one point tore up the track, cut telegraph wires, and loaded on cross ties to be used in bridge burning. Wood and water were taken without difficulty. Andrews very coolly telling the story to which he adhered throughout the run, namely, that he was one of General Beauregard's officers, running an impressed powder train through to that commander at Corinth. We had no good instruments for track raising, as we had intended rather to depend upon fire, but the amount of time spent in taking up a rail was not material at this stage of our journey, as we easily kept on time with our captured train. There was a wonderful exhilaration in passing swiftly by towns and stations through the heart of an enemy's country in this manner. It possessed just enough of the spice of danger in this part of the run to render it thoroughly enjoyable. The slightest accident to our engine, however, or a miscarriage in any part of our program, would have completely changed the conditions. At Etowa we found the Yona, an old locomotive owned by an iron company, standing with steam up but not wishing to alarm the enemy till the local freight had been safely met, we left it unharmed. Kingston, thirty miles from the starting point, was safely reached. A train from Rome, Georgia, on a branch road, had just arrived and was waiting for the morning mail, our train. We learned that the local freight would soon come also, and taking the side track, waited for it. When it arrived, however, Andrew saw, to his surprise and chagrin, that it bore a red flag, indicating another train not far behind. Stepping over the conductor, he boldly asked, 
what does it mean that the road is blocked in this manner when i have orders to take this powder to beauregard without a minute's delay the answer was interesting but not reassuring mitchell has captured huntsville and is said to be coming to chattanooga and we are getting everything out of here he was asked by andrews to pull his train a long way down the track out of the way and promptly obeyed it seemed an exceedingly long time before the expected extra arrived and when it did come it bore another red flag the reason given was that the local being too great for one engine had been made up in two sections and the second section would doubtless be along in a short time this was terribly vexatious yet there seemed nothing to do but to wait to start out between the sections of an extra train would be to court destruction there were already three trains around us and their many passengers and others were all growing very curious about the mysterious train manned by strangers which had arrived on the time of the morning mail for an hour and five minutes from the time of arrival at kingston we remained in this most critical position the sixteen of us who were shut up tightly in a box-car personating beauregard's ammunition hearing sounds outside but unable to distinguish words had perhaps the most trying position andrew sent us by one of the engineers a cautious warning to be ready to fight in case the uneasiness of the crowd around led them to make any investigation while he himself kept near the station to prevent the sending off of any alarming telegram so intolerable was our suspense that the order for a deadly conflict would have been felt as a relief but the assurance of andrews quieted the crowd until the whistle of the expected train from the north was heard then as it glided up to the depot past the end of our side track we were off without more words but unexpected danger had arisen behind us out of the panic at big shanty two men emerged determined if possible to foil the unknown captors of their train there was no telegraph station and no locomotive at hand with which to follow but the conductor of the train w a fuller and anthony murphy foremen of the atlanta railway machine shops who happened to be on board of fuller's train started on foot after us as hard as they could run finding a hand car they mounted it and pushed forward till they neared etowah where they ran on the break we had made in the road and were precipitated down the embankment into the ditch continuing with more caution they reached etowah and found the yona which was at once pressed into service loaded with soldiers who were at hand and hurried with flying wheels toward kingston fuller prepared to fight at that point for he knew of the tangle of extra trains and of the lateness of the regular trains and did not think we should be able to pass we had been gone only four minutes when he arrived and found himself stopped by three long heavy trains of cars headed in the wrong direction to move them out of the way so as to pass would cause a delay he was little inclined to afford would indeed have almost certainly given us the victory so abandoning his engine he with murphy ran across to the rome train and uncoupling the engine and one car pushed forward with about forty armed men as the rome branch connected with the main road above the depot he encountered no hindrance and it was now a fair race we were not many minutes ahead four miles from kingston we again stopped and cut the telegraph while trying to take up a rail at this point we were greatly startled one end of the rail was loosened and eight of us were pulling at it when in the distance we distinctly heard the whistle of a pursuing engine with a frantic effort we broke the rail and all tumbled over the embankment with the effort we moved on and at adairsville we found a mixed train freight and passenger waiting but there was an express on the road that had not yet arrived we could afford no more delay and set out for the next station calhoun at terrible speed hoping to reach that point before the express which was behind time should arrive the nine miles which we had to travel were left behind in less than the same number of minutes the express was just pulling out but hearing our whistle backed before us until we were able to take the side track it stopped however in such a manner as completely to close up the other end of the switch the two trains side by side almost touched each other and our precipitate arrival caused natural suspicion many searching questions were asked which had to be answered before we could get the opportunity of proceeding 
We in the box-car could hear the altercation, and were almost sure that a fight would be necessary before the conductor would consent to pull up in order to let us out. Here again our position was most critical, for the pursuers were rapidly approaching. Fuller and Murphy saw the obstruction of the broken rail in time by reversing their engine to prevent wreck, but the hindrance was for the present insuperable. Leaving all their men behind, they started for a second foot-race. Before they had gone far, they met the train we had passed at Adairsville, and turned it back after us. At Adairsville they dropped the cars, and with locomotive and tender loaded with armed men, they drove forward at the highest speed possible. They knew that we were not many minutes ahead, and trusted to overhaul us before the express train could be safely passed. But Andrews had told the powder story again with all his skill and added a direct request in peremptory form to have the way opened before him which the confederate conductor did not see fit to resist and just before the pursuers arrived at calhoun we were again under way stopping once more to cut wires and tear up the track we felt a thrill of exhilaration to which we had long been strangers the track was now clear before us to chattanooga and even west of that city we had good reason to believe that we should find no other train in the way till we had reached Mitchell's lines. If one rail could now be lifted, we would be in a few minutes at the Ustanala Bridge, and that burned, the rest of the task would be little more than simple manual labor, with the enemy absolutely powerless. We worked with a will. But in a moment the tables were turned. Not far behind, we heard the scream of a locomotive bearing down upon us at lightning speed. The men on board were in plain sight and well armed. Two minutes, perhaps one, would have removed the rail at which we were toiling. Then the game would have been in our hands, for there was no other locomotive beyond that could be turned back after us. But the most desperate efforts were in vain. The rail was simply bent, and we hurried to our engine and darted away, while remorselessly after us thundered the enemy. Now the contestants were in clear view, and a race followed unparalleled in the annals of war. Wishing to gain a little time, for the burning of the Ustanala Bridge, we dropped one car, and, shortly after, another, but they were picked up and pushed ahead to Rosaka. We were obliged to run over the high trestles and covered bridge at that point, without a pause. This was the first failure in the work assigned us. The Confederates could not overtake and stop us on the road, but their aim was to keep close behind, so that we might not be able to damage the road or take in wood or water. In the former they succeeded, but not in the latter. Both engines were put at the highest rate of speed. We were obliged to cut the wire after every station passed, in order that an alarm might not be sent ahead, and we constantly strove to throw our pursuers off the track, or to obstruct the road permanently in some way, so that we might be able to burn the Chickamauga bridges still ahead. The chances seemed good that Fuller and Murphy would be wrecked, we broke out the end of our last box-car, and dropped cross-ties on the track as we ran, thus checking their progress and getting far enough ahead to take in wood and water at two separate stations. Several times we almost lifted a rail, but each time the coming of the Confederates within rifle range compelled us to desist and speed on. Our worst hindrance was the rain. The previous day, Friday, had been clear, with a high wind, and on such a day fire would have been easily and tremendously effective. But to-day a bridge could be burned only with abundance of fuel and careful nursing. Thus we sped on, mile after mile, in this fearful chase, round curves and past stations in seemingly endless perspective. Whenever we lost sight of the enemy beyond a curve, we hoped that some of our obstructions had been effected in throwing him from the track, and that we should see him no more but at each long reach backward the smoke was again seen, and the shrill whistle was like the scream of a bird of prey. The time could not have been so very long, for the terrible speed was rapidly devouring the distance, but with our nerves strained to the highest tension each minute seemed an hour. On several occasions the escape of the enemy from wreck was little less than miraculous. At one point a rail was placed across the track on a curve so skillfully that it was not seen till the train ran upon it at full speed. Fuller says that they were terribly jolted, and seemed to bounce altogether from the track, but lighted on the rails in safety. Some of the Confederates wished to leave a train which was driven at such a reckless rate, but their wishes were not gratified. B. 
Before reaching Dalton, we urged Andrews to turn and attack the enemy, laying an ambush so as to get into close quarters, that our revolvers might be on equal terms with their guns. I have little doubt that if this had been carried out it would have succeeded, but either because he thought the chance of wrecking or obstructing the enemy still good, or feared that the country ahead had been alarmed by a telegram around the Confederacy by the way of Richmond, Andrews merely gave the plan his sanction without making any attempt to carry it into execution. Dalton was passed without difficulty, and beyond we stopped again to cut wires and to obstruct the track. It happened that a regiment was encamped not a hundred yards away, but they did not molest us. Fuller had written a dispatch to Chattanooga, and dropped a man with orders to have it forwarded instantly, while he pushed on to save the bridges. Part of the message got through and created a wild panic in Chattanooga, although it did not materially influence our fortunes. Our supply of fuel was now very short, and without getting rid of our pursuers long enough to take in more, it was evident that we could not run as far as Chattanooga. While cutting the wire we made an attempt to get up another rail, but the enemy, as usual, were too quick for us. We had no tool for this purpose except a wedge-pointed iron bar. Two or three bent iron claws for pulling out spikes would have given us such incontestable superiority that down to almost the last of our run we should have been able to escape and even to burn all the Chickamauga bridges. But it had not been our intention to rely on this mode of obstruction an emergency only rendered necessary by our unexpected delay in the pouring rain. We made no attempt to damage the long tunnel north of Dalton, as our enemies had greatly dreaded. The last hope of the raid was now staked upon an effort of a kind different from any that we had yet made, but which, if successful, would still enable us to destroy the bridges nearest Chattanooga. But on the other hand, its failure would terminate the chase, Life and success were put upon one throw. A few more obstructions were dropped on the track, and our own speed increased so that we soon forged a considerable distance ahead. The side and end boards of the last car were torn into shreds. All available fuel was piled upon it, and blazing brands were brought back from the engine. By the time we approached a long covered bridge, a fire in the car was fairly started. We uncoupled it in the middle of the bridge, and with painful suspense waited the issue. Oh, for a few minutes till the work of conflagration was fairly begun. There was still steam pressure enough in our boiler to carry us to the next wood-yard, where we could have replenished our fuel by force if necessary, so as to run as near to Chattanooga as was deemed prudent. We did not know of the telegraph message which the pursuers had sent ahead. But alas, the minutes were not given. Before the bridge was extensively fired, the enemy was upon us, and we moved slowly onward, looking back to see what they would do next. We had not long to conjecture. The Confederates pushed right into the smoke and drove the burning car before them to the next side track. With no car left and no fuel, the last scrap having thrown into the engine or upon the burning car, and with no obstruction to drop on the track, our situation was indeed desperate. A few minutes only remained until our steed of iron, which had so well served us, would be powerless. But it might still be possible to save ourselves. If we left the train in a body, and taking a direct course toward the Union lines, hurried over the mountains at right angles with their course, we could not, from the nature of the country, be followed by cavalry, and could easily travel, athletic young men as we were, and fleeing for life, as rapidly as any pursuers. There was no telegraph in the mountainous districts west and northwest of us, and the prospect of reaching the Union lines seemed to me then, as has always since seemed, very fair. Confederate pursuers with whom I have since conversed freely have agreed on two points, that we could have escaped in the manner here pointed out, and that an attack on the pursuing train would likely have been successful. But Andrews thought otherwise, at least in relation to the former plan, and ordered us to jump from the locomotive one by one, and dispersing into the woods each endeavor to save himself. Thus ended the Andrews Railroad Raid. It is easy now to understand why Mitchell paused thirty miles west of Chattanooga. The Andrews Raiders had been forced to stop eighteen miles south of the same town, 
and no flying train met him with the expected tidings that all railroad communications of chattanooga were destroyed and that the town was in a panic and undefended he dared advance no farther without heavy reinforcements from pittsburgh landing or the north and he probably believed to the day of his death six months later that the whole andrews party had perished without accomplishing anything a few words will give the sequel to this remarkable enterprise there was great excitement in chattanooga and in the whole of the surrounding confederate territory for scores of miles the hunt for the fugitive raiders was prompt energetic and completely successful ignorant of the country disorganized and far from the union lines they strove in vain to escape several were captured the same day on which they left the cars and all but two within a week even these two were overtaken and brought back when they supposed that they were virtually out of danger two of those who had failed to be on the train were identified and added to the band of prisoners now follows the saddest part of the story being in citizens dress within an enemy's lines the whole party were held as spies and closely and vigorously guarded a court-martial was convened and the leader and seven others out of the twenty-two were condemned and executed the remainder were never brought to trial probably because of the advance of union forces and the consequent confusion into which the affairs of the departments of east tennessee and georgia were thrown of the remaining fourteen eight succeeded by a bold effort attacking their guard in broad daylight in making their escape from atlanta georgia and ultimately in reaching the north the other six who shared in this effort but were recaptured remained prisoners until the latter part of march eighteen sixty three when they were exchanged through a special arrangement made with secretary stanton all the survivors of this expedition received medals and promotion the pursuers also received expressions of gratitude from their fellow confederates notably from the governor and the legislature of georgia end of the locomotive chase in georgia by william pittenger the lord's command by j w mahood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org by the master's final words to his disciples the obligation is laid upon every christian to be a soul winner ye shall be my witness is the risen lord's message to all his followers no one is excused follow me said christ and i will make you fishers of men and when his face was set toward calvary he said to the father as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world by the mouth of the prophet ezekiel god distinctly says that if we neglect to warn the wicked from his way that wicked men shall die in his iniquity but his blood will I require at thine hand. We are all sent, and if we shrink or excuse ourselves from our great mission, we shall come into condemnation. The unsaved multitudes know that every Christian should be an ambassador for Christ, and when we fail to do our duty, we are condemned in their eyes as well as before God. A writer in the Epworth era says, A college professor who was noted among his fellow teachers for his habit of addressing young men upon their personal relations to Christ was asked by one of his fellow professors, Do they not resent your appeals as an impertinence? He replied, No. Nothing is of such interest to any man as his own soul and its condition. We will never resent words of warning or comfort if they are prompted by genuine feeling. When I was a young man, I felt as you do. My wife's cousin, a young fellow not yet of age, lived in our house for six months. My dread of meddling was such that i never asked him to be present at family worship or spoke to him on the subject of religion he fell into the company of a wild set and was rapidly going to the bad when i reasoned with him i spoke to christ do you call yourself a christian he asked assuming his astonished look i hope so i replied but you are not if you were he must be your best friend yet i have lived in your house for six months and you have never once named his name to me no he is nothing to you i have never forgotten the rebuke end of the lord's command 
by J. W. Mahood. On Sumner and the South by L. Q. C. Lamar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was certainly a gracious act on the part of Charles Sumner toward the South, though unhappily it jarred on the sensibilities of the people at the other extreme of the Union, to propose to erase from the banners of the National Army the mementos of the bloody internal struggle which might be regarded as assailing the pride or wounding the sensibilities of the Southern people. The proposal will never be forgotten by that people so long as the name of Charles Sumner lives in the memory of man. But while it touched the heart and elicited her profound gratitude, her people would not have asked of the North such an act of self-renunciation. Conscious that they themselves were animated by devotion to constitutional liberty, and that the brightest pages of history are replete with evidences of the depth and sincerity of that devotion, they can but cherish the recollection of the battles fought and the victories won in defense of their hopeless cause, and respecting, as all true and brave men must respect, the martial spirit with which the men of the North vindicated the integrity of the Union, and their devotion to the principles of human freedom, they do not ask, they do not wish the North to strike the mementos of heroism and victory from either records or monuments or battle flags. They would rather that both sections should gather up the glories won by each section, not envious, but proud of each other, and regard them as a common heritage of American valor. Let us hope that future generations, when they remember the deeds of heroism and devotion done on both sides, will speak not of northern prowess or southern courage, but of the heroism, courage, and fortitude of the Americans in a war of ideas, a war in which each section signalized its consecration to the principles, as each understood them, of American liberty and of the Constitution received from their fathers. Charles Sumner in life believed that all occasion for strife and distrust between the North and South had passed away, and there no longer remained any cause for continued estrangement between those two sections of our common country. Are there not many of us who believe the same thing? Is not that the common sentiment, or if not, ought it not to be, of the great mass of our people, North and South? Bound to each other by a common constitution, destined to live together under a common government, forming unitedly but a single member of the great family of nations, shall we not now at last endeavor to grow toward each other once more in heart, as we are indissolubly linked to each other in fortunes? Shall we not, while honoring the memory of this great champion of liberty, this feeling sympathizer with human sorrow, this earnest pleader for the exercise of human tenderness and heavenly charity, lay aside the concealments which serve only to perpetuate misunderstandings and distrust, and frankly confess that on both sides we most earnestly desire to be one, one not merely in political organization, one not merely in community of language and literature and traditions and country, but more and better than all that, one also in feeling and in heart, Am I mistaken in this? Do the concealments of which I speak still cover animosities, which neither time, nor reflection, nor the march of events have yet sufficed to subdue? I cannot believe it. Since I have been here I have scrutinized your sentiments, as expressed not merely in public debate, but in the abandon of personal confidence. I know well the sentiments of these, my southern friends whose hearts are so enfolded that the feeling of each is the feeling of all, and I see on both sides only the seeming of a constraint which each apparently hesitates to dismiss. The South, prostrate, exhausted, drained of her life-blood, as well as her material resources, yet still honorable and true, accepts a bitter award of the bloody arbitrament without reservation, 
resolutely determined to abide the result with chivalrous fidelity yet as if struck dumb by the magnitude of her reverses she suffers on in silence the north exultant in her triumph and elevated by success still cherishes as we are assured a heart full of magnanimous emotions toward her disarmed and discomfited antagonist and yet as if under mysterious spell her words and acts are words and acts of suspicion and distrust would that the spirit of the illustrious dead whom we lament to-day could speak from the grave to both parties to this deplorable discord in tones which would reach each and every heart throughout this broad territory my countrymen know one another and you will love one another End of On Sumner and the South Sarah Bernhardt Entry from the Encyclopedia Britannica of 1910 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times Sarah Bernhardt from the Encyclopedia Britannica of 1910 Bernhardt, Sarah, Rosine Bernard, 1845-2, French actress, was born in Paris on the 22nd of October, 1845, of mixed French and Dutch parentage, and of Jewish descent. She was, however, baptized at the age of twelve, and brought up in a convent. At thirteen she entered the Conservatoire, where she gained the second prize for tragedy in 1861, and for comedy in 1862. Her debut was made at the Comédie Française on the 11th of August, 1862, in a minor part in Racine's Iphigenie and Olide, without any marked success nor did she do much better in burlesque at the Porte saint martin and Gymnase. In 1867 she became a member of the company at the Orient, where she made her first definite successes as Cordelia in a French translation of King Lear, as the Queen in Victor Hugo's Roy Bla, and, above all, as Zanetto in François Capi, Le Passant, 1869, when peace was restored after the Franco-German War, she left the Odeon for the Comédie Française, thereby incurring a considerable monetary forfeit. From that time she steadily increased her reputation, two of the most definite steps in her progress being her performance of Phaedre in Racine's play, 1874, and of Doña Sol in Victor Hugo's Hernani, 1877. In 1879 she had a famous season at the Gaiety in London. By this time her position as the greatest actress of her day was securely established. Her amazing power of emotional acting, the extraordinary realism and pathos of her death scenes, the magnetism of her personality, and the beauty of her voix d'or made the public tolerant of her occasional caprices. She had developed some skill as a sculptor, and exhibited at the Salon at various times between 1876, honorable mention, and 1881. She also exhibited a painting there in 1880. In 1878 she published a prose sketch, Dans les Nuages, Les Impressions de Une Chaise. Her comedy, La Vue, was produced in 1888 at the Odeon, without much success. Her relations with the other societaires of the Comédie Française, having become somewhat strained, a crisis arrived in 1880, when, enraged by an unfavorable criticism of her acting, she threw up her position on the day following the first performance of Émile Augier's L'Aventurière. This obliged her to pay a forfeit of £4,000 for breach of contract. Immediately after the rupture, she gave a series of performances in London, relying chiefly upon Scribe and Le Gauvais, Adrien Le Couvrier, and Milhac and 
Halavez, Fru Fru. These were followed by tours in Denmark, America, and Russia during 1880 and 1881, with La Dame aux Camélias as the principal attraction. In 1882, she married Jacques de Mala, a Greek, in London, but separated from him at the end of the following year. After a fresh triumph in Paris with Sardos Ferrara at the Vaudeville, she became proprietress of the Porte Saint Martin. Jean Richepin's Nana Sahib, eighteen eighty three, Sardos Theodora, eighteen eighty four, and La Tosca, eighteen eighty seven, Jules Barbier's Jeanne d'Arc, eighteen ninety, and Sardot and Moreau's Cleopatra, eighteen ninety were among her most conspicuous successes here, where she remained till she became proprietress of the Renaissance Theatre in 1893. During those ten years she made several extended tours, including visits to America in 1886 to 1887 and 1888 to 1889. Between 1891 and 1893 she again visited America, North and South, Australia, and the chief European capitals. In November 1893, she opened the Renaissance with Le Roy by Jules Lemaitre, which was followed by Sylvestre and Morin's Isale, 1894, Sardot's Gismonda, 1894, and Edmond Rostand's La Princesse Ayontaine, 1895. In 1895, she also appeared with conspicuous success as Magda in a French translation of Sudermann's Heimat. For the next few years, she visited London almost annually and America in 1896. In that year, she made a success with an adaptation of Alfred de Musset's Lorenzacchio. In Easter week of 1897, she played in a religious drama, La Samaritaine, by Rostand. In December 1896, an elaborate fete was organized in Paris in her honor, and the value of this public recognition of her position at the head of her profession was enhanced by cordial greetings from all parts of the world. By this time, she had played 112 parts, 38 of which she had created. Early in 1899, she removed from the Renaissance to the Théâtre de Nation, a larger house which she opened with a revival of La Tosca. In the same year, she made the bold experiment of a French production of Hamlet, in which she played the title part. She repeated the impersonation in London not long afterwards, where she also appeared, 1901, as the fate-ridden son of Napoleon I. In Rostand's L'Aiglon, which had been produced in Paris the year before, of the successful productions of her later years, perhaps none was more remarkable than her impersonation of La Tisbe in Victor Hugo's romantic drama, Angelo, 1905. End of entry, Sarah Bernhardt, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1910. Steam on Country Roads by Richard Jeffries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Steam on Country Roads by Richard Jeffries. Losses year after year and increasing competition indicate that the crops now grown are not sufficient to support the farmer. When he endeavours, however, to vary his method of culture, and to introduce something new, he is met at the outset by two great difficulties which crush out the possibility of enterprise. The first of these, the extraordinary tithe, has already come into prominent notice. The second is really even more important. It is the deficiency of transit. An extensive use of steam on common roads appears essential to a revival of agricultural prosperity, because without it, it is almost impossible for delicate and perishable produce to be quickly and cheaply brought to market. Railways, indeed, 
now connect nearly every town of any size whatever throughout the country with the large cities or london but railways are necessarily built as lines of communication between towns and not in reference to scattered farms upon the map the spaces between the various rails do not look very broad but those white bands when actually examined would be found to be six eight ten or even twenty miles wide nor are there stations everywhere so that a farm which may be only six miles from the metals may be ten from the nearest platform goods trains do not as in the united states stop to pick up wherever there is material or produce waiting to be loaded the produce has to be taken where the railway chooses and not where it would suit the farmer's convenience when at last the farmer's wagon reaches the station he finds no particular trouble taken to meet his needs his horse and carters are kept hours and hours perhaps far into the night for a mere matter of a ton or two nor is there any special anxiety shown to deliver his consignment early though if it should not be moved from the company's premises demurrage is charged in short the railway companies knowing that the agriculturists until the formation of the farmers alliance were incapable of united action have used them much as they liked as for the rates charged the evidence recently taken and which is to be continued shows that they are arbitrary and often excessive the accommodation is poor in the extreme the charge is high the speed low and every condition against the farmer this in its turn drives the farmer more into the hands of the middleman the latter makes a study of the rail and its awkward ways and manages to get the goods through of course adding to their cost when they reach the public without the dealer under present circumstances the farmer would often find it practically impossible to get to markets not in his immediate neighbourhood the rail and its awkward inconvenient ways actually shut him off in manufacturing districts the transit of iron and minerals and worked-up metal is managed with considerable ability there are appointed to manage the goods traffic men who are alert to the conditions of modern requirements and quick to meet them in agricultural districts the question often arises if there be really any responsible local goods managers at all it seems to be left to men who are little more than labourers and who cannot understand the patent fact that times are different now from what they were thirty years since when they first donned their uniforms the railways may bring their books and any number of their officers to prove that everything is perfectly satisfactory but the feeling remains nevertheless that it is exactly the contrary look at the map and place the finger on any of the spaces between the lines of rail take then the case of a farmer in the midst of that space not more than five or six miles from the metals and able at times to hear the distant whistle of the engines but not less than eight from a station this present season he finds his wheat damaged by the rain after it was cut and he comes to the conclusion that he must supplement his ordinary crops by some special culture in order to make his way on the last occasion he was in a large city he was much struck by the quantity of fruit which he found was imported from abroad the idea naturally occurs to him of setting aside some ten or twenty acres of his holding of four hundred or five hundred for the culture of fruit he goes to his landlord who is only too willing to give him every facility provided that no injury be done to the soil he faces the monstrous injustice of the extraordinary tithes and expends fresh capital in the planting of various kinds of fruit in places at that distance from a station labour is dear relative to the low profit on the ordinary style of farming but very cheap relative to the possible profits on an improved and specialised system the amount of extra labour he thus employs in the preparation of the ground the planting cleaning picking and packing is an inestimable boon to the humbler population not only men but women and children can assist at times and earn enough to add an appreciable degree of comfort to their homes in itself this is a valuable result but now suppose our enterprising farmer 
has the fortune to have a good season and to see his twenty acres teeming with produce he sets as many hands on as possible to get it in but now what is he to do with it send it to london that is easily said but trace the process through the goods perishable and delicate must first be carted to the railway station and delivered there eight miles from the farm at most inconvenient hours they must be loaded into slow goods trains which may not reach town for four and twenty hours there is not the slightest effort to accelerate the transit and the rates are high by the time the produce reaches the market its gloss and value are diminished and the cost of transit has eaten away the profit the thing has been tried over and over again and demonstrated one need only go to the nearest greengrocers to obtain practical proof of it the apples he sells are american the farmers in new york state or massachusetts can grow apples pack them in barrels dispatch them two thousand eight hundred miles to liverpool and they can then be scattered all over the country and still sold cheaper than the fruit from english orchards this is an extraordinary fact showing the absolute need of speedy and cheap transit to the english farmer if he is to rise again of what value is his proximity to the largest city in the world of what value is it that he is only ninety miles from london if it cost him more to send his apples about ninety miles than it does his american kinsman very nearly three thousand as we have in this country no great natural waterways like the rivers and lakes of the united states our best resource is evidently to be found in the development of the excellent common roads which traverse the country and may be said practically to pass every man's door upon these a goods train may be run to every farm and loaded at the gate of the field this assertion is not too bold the thing indeed is already done in a manner much more difficult to accomplish than that proposed traction engines weighing many tons so heavy as to sometimes endanger bridges and drawing two trucks loaded with tons of coal chalk bricks or other materials have already been seen on the roads travelling considerable distances and in no wise impeded by steep gradients so little indeed that they ascend the downs and supply farms situated in the most elevated positions with fuel what is this but a goods train and a goods train of the clumsiest most awkward and consequently unprofitable description yet it is run and it would not be run were it not to some extent useful anything more hideous it would be hard to conceive yet if the world patiently submits to it for the welfare of the agricultural community what possible objection can there be to engines so formed as to avoid every one of the annoyances caused by it it may be asserted without the slightest fear of contradiction that there are at least fifty engineering firms in this country who could send forth a road locomotive very nearly noiseless very nearly smokeless certainly sparkless capable of running up and down hill on our smooth and capital roads perfectly under control not in the least alarming to horses and able to draw two or more trucks or passenger cars round all their devious windings at a speed at least equal to that of a moderate trot say eight miles an hour why then do we not see such useful road trains running to and fro why indeed in the first place progress in this direction is absolutely stopped by the acts of parliament regulating agricultural engines the act in question was passed at a time when steam was still imperfectly understood it was in itself a perfectly judicious act which ought to be even more strictly enforced than it is but it was intended solely and wholly for the regulation of those vast and monstrous looking engines which it was at once foreseen if left to run wild would frighten all horse traffic off the roads the possibility of road locomotives in the reasonable sense of the term was not even in the minds of the framers yet by a singular perversity this very act has shut off steam from one of its most legitimate functions it is quite possible that the depression of agriculture may have the effect of drawing attention to this subject and if so it will be but tardy justice to the rest of society 
that the very calling whose engines now block the roads should thus in the end open them we should then see goods trains passing every farm and loading at the gate of the field such a road goods train would not of course run regularly to and fro in the same stereotyped direction but would call as previously ordered and make three or four journeys a day sometimes loading entirely from one farm sometimes making up a load from several farms in succession besides the quick communication thus opened up with the railway station and the larger towns the farmer would be enabled to work his tenancy with fewer horses he would get manures coal and all other goods delivered for him instead of fetching them he would get his produce landed for him instead of sending his own teams men and boys in a short time as the railways began to awaken to the new state of things they would see the advantage of accommodating their arrangements and open their yards and sidings to their competitor in the case of long journeys and with some kinds of goods in order to save the cost of transshipment it would be possible to transfer the bed of the road truck from its frame on to the frame of the railroad truck so that the goods with one loading might pass direct to london our american cousins are quite capable of inventing a transferable truck of this kind in return goods loaded in london would never leave the same bottom till unloaded at the farmyard or in the midst of the village for all long journeys the rails would probably always remain the great carriers and the road trains serve as their most valuable feeders when farmers found it possible to communicate with the cities at reasonable rates and at reasonable speed they would be encouraged to put forth fresh efforts to plant vegetables to grow fruit to supplement their larger crops with every species of lesser produce this in its turn would bring new traffic to the lines for instead of one or two crops in the year only there will be three or four requiring carriage there would be then speedy results of such improved communication one would be an increased value of land the second an increase in the number of small areas occupied and cultivated the third an increase in the rural population a fourth would be that the incredible amount of money which is now annually transferred to the continent and america for the purchase of every kind of lesser produce would remain in this country to the multiplication of the accounts at post office savings banks every one who possibly could would grow or fatten something when he could just put it on a road train and send it off to market two through passenger road trains a day one in each direction carrying light parcels as well and traversing say forty or fifty miles or less would probably soon obtain sufficient support as they ran from village to village and market town to market town at present those who live in villages are practically denied locomotion unless they are well enough off to keep a horse and trap and a man to look after them a person residing in a village must either remain in the village or walk or go by carrier the carrier stops at every inn and takes a day to get over ten miles the exposure in the carrier's cart has been the cause of serious illness to many and many a poor woman obliged to travel by it and sit in the wind and rain for hours and hours together unless they ride in this vehicle or tramp on foot the villagers are simply shut off from the world they have neither omnibus tramway nor train those who have not lived in a village have no idea of the isolation possible even in this nineteenth century and with the telegraph brought to the local post office the swift message of the electric wire and the slow transit of the material person the speed of the written thought and the slowness of the bodily presence are in strange contrast when people do not move about freely commerce is practically at a standstill but if two passenger road trains travelling at an average speed of not more than eight miles an hour one going up and the other down and connecting two or more market towns and lines of railway pass through the village how different would be the state of things ease of transit multiplies business and besides passengers a large amount of light material could thus be conveyed there would be depots at the central places 
but such trains could stop to pick up travellers at any gate door or stile if the route did not go through every hamlet it would pass near enough to enable persons to walk to it and join the carriages no one objects to walk one mile if he can afterwards ride the other ten besides these through trains special trains could run on occasions when numbers of people wanted to go to one spot such as sheep or cattle fairs and great markets large tracts of country look to one town as their central place not by any means always the nearest market town to such places for instance as gloucester and reading thousands resort in the course of the year from hamlets at a considerable distance such road trains as have been described would naturally converge on provincial towns of this kind and bring them thrice their present trade country people only want facilities to travel exactly like city people it is indeed quite possible that when villages thus become accessible many moderately well-to-do people will choose them for their residence in preference to large towns for health and cheapness if any number of such persons took up their residence in villages the advantage to farmers would of course be that they would have good customers for all minor produce at their doors it is not too much to say that three parts of england are quite as much in need of opening up as the backwoods of america when a new railroad track is pushed over prairie and through primeval woods settlements spring up beside it when road trains run through remote hamlets those remote hamlets will awake to a new life many country towns of recent years have made superhuman efforts to get the railway to their doors some have succeeded some are still trying in no case has it been accomplished without an immense expenditure and for the most part these railroad branches are completely in the control of the main line with which they are connected in one or two cases progress has been effected by means of tramways notably one at wantage an excellent idea and highly to be commended all these are signs that by slow degrees matters are tending towards some such scheme as has been here sketched out while local railroads are extremely expensive slow in construction and always dominated by main lines and while tramways need rails with the paraphernalia rails require they have this drawback they are not flexible the engines and cars that run upon them must for ever adhere to the track there may be goods produce ricks cows fruit hops and what not wanting to be landed only a quarter of a mile distant but the cars cannot go to the crops the railroad is rigid everything must be brought to it from town to town it answers well but it cannot suit itself and wind about from village to hamlet from farm to farm up hill and down dale the projected road train is flexible and capable of coming to the crops it can call at the farmer's door and wait by the gate of the field for the load we have lately seen france devote an enormous sum to the laying down of rails in agricultural districts to the making of canals and generally to the improvement of internal communication in provinces but thinly populated the industrious french have recognized that old countries whose area is limited can only compete with america whose area is almost unlimited by rendering transit easy and cheap we in england shall ultimately have to apply the same fact end of steam on country roads by richard jeffries a vindication of natural diet by percy bysshe shelley this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Vindication of Natural Diet by Percy Bysshe Shelley I hold that the depravity of the physical and moral nature of man originated in his unnatural habits of life. The origin of man, like that of the universe of which he is a part, is enveloped in impenetrable mystery. His generations either had a beginning or they had not. The weight of evidence in favor of each of these suppositions seems tolerably equal, and it is perfectly unimportant to the present argument which is assumed. The language spoken, however, by the mythology of nearly all religions seems to prove that at some distant period man forsook the path of nature 
and sacrificed the purity and happiness of his being to unnatural appetites the date of this event seems to have also been that of some great change in the climates of the earth with which it has an obvious correspondence the allegory of adam and eve eating of the tree of evil and entailing upon their posterity the wrath of god and the loss of everlasting life admits of no other explanation than the disease and crime that have flowed from unnatural diet milton was so well aware of this that he makes raphael thus exhibit to adam the consequence of his disobedience immediately a place before his eyes appeared sad noisome dark a lazar house it seemed wherein were laid numbers of all diseased all maladies of ghastly spasm or racking torture qualms of heart-sick agony all feverous kinds convulsions epilepsy fierce catars intestine stone and ulcer colic pangs demoniac frenzy moping melancholy and moonstruck madness pining atrophy marasmus and wide-wasting pestilence dropsies and asthmas and joint-racking rooms and how many thousands more might not be added to this frightful catalogue the story of prometheus is one likewise which although universally admitted to be allegorical has never been satisfactorily explained prometheus stole fire from heaven and was chained for this crime to mount caucasus where a vulture continually devoured his liver that grew to meet its hunger hesiod says that before the time of prometheus mankind were exempt from suffering that they enjoyed a vigorous youth and that death when at length it came approached like sleep and gently closed their eyes again so general was this opinion that horace a poet of the augustan age writes audax omnia perpeti gens humana ruit per vetivum nefas audax iapeti genus ignum fraud mala gentibus intulit post ignum etheria domo subductum maces et nova febrium terris incubit cohors simotiqua prius tarda necessitas lethi corapuit gradum how plain a language is spoken by all this prometheus who represents the human race affected some great change in the condition of his nature and applied fire to culinary purposes thus inventing an expedient for screening from his disgust the horrors of the shambles from this moment his vitals were devoured by the vulture of disease it consumed his being in every shape of its loathsome and infinite variety inducing the soul-quelling sinkings of premature and violent death all vice arose from the ruin of healthful innocence tyranny superstition commerce and inequality were then first known when reason vainly attempted to guide the wanderings of exasperated passion i conclude this part of the subject with an extract from mr newton's defence of vegetable regimen from whom I have borrowed this interpretation of the fable of Prometheus. Making allowance for such transposition of the events of the allegory as time might produce after the important truths were forgotten, which this portion of the ancient mythology was intended to transmit, the drift of the fable seems to be this. Man at his creation was endowed with the gift of perpetual youth. That is, he was not formed to be a sickly suffering creature, as we now see him, but to enjoy health and to sink by slow degrees into the bosom of his parent earth without disease or pain prometheus first taught the use of animal food primus bovum occidit prometheus and of fire with which to render it more digestible and pleasing to the taste jupiter and the rest of the gods foreseeing the consequences of these inventions were amused or irritated at the short-sighted devices of the newly formed creature and left him to experience the sad effects of them thirst the necessary concomitant of a flesh diet perhaps of all diet vitiated by culinary preparation ensued water was resorted to and man forfeited the inestimable gift of health which he had received from heaven he became diseased the partaker of a precarious existence and no longer descended slowly to his grave but just disease to luxury succeeds in every death its own avenger breeds the fury passions from that blood began and turned on man a fiercer savage man Man and the animals whom he has infected with his society, or depraved by his dominion, are alone diseased. The wild hog, the mouflon, the bison, and the wolf are perfectly exempt from malady, and invariably die, either from external violence or natural old age. But the domestic hog, the sheep, the cow, and the dog are subject to an incredible variety of distempers, and, like the corruptors of their nature, have physicians who thrive upon their miseries. The supereminence of man is like Satan's a super of pain and the majority of his species doomed to penury 
disease and crime have reasons to curse the untoward event that by enabling him to communicate his sensations raised him above the level of his fellow animals but the steps that have been taken are irrevocable the whole of human science is comprised in one question how can the advantages of intellect and civilization be reconciled with the liberty and pure pleasures of natural life how can we take the benefits and reject the evils of the system which is now interwoven with all the fibres of our being i believe that abstinence from animal food and spirituous liquors would in a great measure capaciate us for the solution of this important question comparative anatomy teaches us that man resembles frugivorous animals in everything and carnivores in nothing he has neither claws wherewith to seize his prey nor distinct and pointed teeth to tear the living fibre a mandarin of the first class with nails two inches long would probably find them alone inefficient to hold even a hair after every subterfuge of gluttony the bull must be degraded into the ox and the ram into the weather by an unnatural and inhuman operation that the flaccid fibre may offer a fainter resistance to rebellious nature it is only by softening and disguising dead flesh by culinary preparation that it is rendered susceptible of mastication or digestion and that the sight of its bloody juices and raw horror does not excite intolerable loathing and disgust let the advocate of animal food force himself to a decisive experiment on its fitness and as plutarch recommends tear a living lamb with his teeth and plunging his head into its vitals slake his thirst with the steaming blood when fresh from the deed of horror let him revert to the irresistible instincts of nature that would rise in judgment against it and say nature formed me for such work as this then and then only would he be consistent man resembles no carnivorous animal there is no exception except man be one to the rule of herbivorous animals having cellulated colons the orangutan perfectly resembles man both in the order and number of his teeth the orangutan is the most anthropomorphous of the ape tribe all of which are strictly frugivorous there is no other species of animals in which this analogy exists in many frugivorous animals the canine teeth are more pointed and distinct than those of man the resemblance also of the human stomach to that of the orangutan is greater than to that of any other animal the intestines are also identical with those of herbivorous animals which present a large surface for absorption and have ample and cellulated colons the caseum also though short is larger than that of carnivorous animals and even here the orangutan retains its accustomed similarity the structure of the human frame then is that of one fitted to a pure vegetable diet in every essential particular it is true that the reluctance to abstain from animal food in those who have been long accustomed to its stimulus is so great in some persons of weak minds as to be scarcely overcome but this is far from bringing any argument in its favour a lamb which was fed for some time on flesh by a ship's crew refused its natural diet at the end of the voyage there are numerous instances of horses sheep oxen and even wood pigeons having been taught to live upon flesh until they have loathed their natural ailment young children evidently prefer pastry oranges apples and other fruit to the flesh of animals until by the gradual deprivation of the digestive organs the free use of vegetables has for a time produced serious inconveniences for a time i say since there never was an instance wherein a change from spirituous liquors and animal food to vegetables and pure water has failed ultimately to invigorate the body by rendering its juices bland and consentaneous and to restore to the mind that cheerfulness and elasticity which not one in fifty possesses on the present system a love of strong liquors is also with difficulty taught to infants almost every one remembers the wry faces the first glass of port produced unsophisticated instinct is invariably unerring but to decide on the fitness of animal food from the perverted appetites which its constrained adoption produce is to make the criminal a judge in his own cause it is even worse it is appealing to the infatuated drunkard in a question of the salubrity of brandy what is the cause of morbid action in the animal system not the air we breathe for our fellow denizens of nature breathe the same uninjured not the water we drink if remote from the pollutions of man and his inventions for the animals drink it too not the earth we tread upon not the unobscured sight of glorious nature in the wood the field or the expanse of sky and ocean nothing that we are or do in common with the undiseased inhabitants of the forest something then wherein we differ from them our habit of altering our food by fire 
so that our appetite is no longer a just criterion for the fitness of its gratification except in children there remains no traces of that instinct which determines in all other animals what ailment is natural or otherwise and so perfectly obliterated are they in the reasoning adults of our species that it has become necessary to urge considerations drawn from comparative anatomy to prove that we are naturally forgivers crime is madness madness is disease whenever the cause of disease shall be discovered the root from which all vice and misery have so long overshadowed the globe will lie bare to the axe all the exertions of man from that moment may be considered as tending to the clear profit of his species no sane mind in a sane body resolves upon a real crime it is a man of violent passions bloodshot eyes and swollen veins that alone can grasp the knife of murder the system of a simple diet promises no utopian advantages it is no mere reform of legislation whilst the furious passions and the evil propensities of all the human heart in which it had its origin are still unassuaged it strikes at the root of all evil and is an experiment which may be tried with success not alone by nations but by small societies families and even individuals in no cases has a return to vegetable diet produced the slightest injury in most it has been attended with changes undeniably beneficial should ever a physician be born with the genius of locke i am persuaded that he might trace all bodily and mental derangements to our unnatural habits as clearly as that philosopher has traced all knowledge to sensation what prolific sources of disease are not those mineral and vegetable poisons that have been introduced for its extirpation how many thousands have become murderers and robbers bigots and domestic tyrants dissolute and abandoned adventurers from the use of fermented liquors who had they slaked their thirst only at the mountain stream would have lived but to diffuse the happiness of their own unperverted feelings how many groundless opinions and absurd institutions have not received a general sanction from the sottishness and impertinence of individuals who will assert that had the populace of paris drank at the pure source of the seine and satisfied their hunger at the ever furnished table of vegetable nature that they would have lent their brutal suffrage to the prescription list of robespierre could a set of men whose passions were not perverted by unnatural stimuli look with coolness on an auto de fe it is to be believed that a being of gentle feelings rising from his meal of roots would take delight in sports of blood was nero a man of temperate life could you read calm health in his cheek flushed with ungovernable propensities of hatred for the human race did muley as male's pulse beat evenly was his skin transparent did his eyes beam with healthfulness and its invariable concomitants cheerfulness and benignity though history has decided none of these questions a child could not hesitate to answer in the negative surely the bile suffused cheek of bonaparte his wrinkled brow and yellow eye the ceaseless inquietude of his nervous system speak no less plainly the character of his unresting ambition than his murders and his victories it is impossible had bonaparte descended from a race of vegetable feeders that he could have either the inclination or the power to ascend the throne of the bourbons the desire of tyranny could scarcely be excited in the individual the power to tyrannize would certainly not be delegated by a society neither frenzied by inebriation nor rendered impotent or irrational by disease pregnant indeed with inexhaustible calamity is the renunciation of instinct as it concerns our physical nature arithmetic cannot enumerate nor reason perhaps suspect the multitudinous sources of disease in civilized life even common water that apparently innoxious pablum when corrupted by the filth of populous cities is a deadly and insidious destroyer who can wonder that all the inducements held out by god himself in the bible to virtue should have been vainer than a nurse's tale and that those dogmas apparently favorable to the intolerant and angry passions should have alone been deemed essential whilst christians are in the daily practice of all those habits which have infected with disease and crime not only the reprobate sons but these favored children of the common father's love omnipotence itself could not save them from the consequences of this original and universal sin there is no disease bodily or mental which adoption of vegetable diet and pure water has not infallibly mitigated whenever the experiment has been fairly tried debility is gradually converted into strength disease into healthfulness madness in all its hideous variety from the ravings of the fettered maniac to the unaccountable irrationalities of ill-temper 
that make a hell of domestic life, and to a calm and considerable evenness of temper, that alone might offer a certain pledge of the future moral reformation of society. On a natural system of diet, old age would be our last and our only malady. The term of our existence would be protracted. We should enjoy life and no longer preclude others from the enjoyment of it. All sensational delights would be infinitely more exquisite and perfect. The very sense of being would then be a continued pleasure, such as we now feel it in some few and favoured moments of our youth. But all that is sacred in our hopes for the human race, I conjure those who love happiness and truth to give a fair trial to the vegetable system. Reasoning is surely superfluous on a subject whose merits an experience of six months would set forever at rest. But it is only among the enlightened and benevolent that so great a sacrifice of appetite and prejudice can be expected, even though its ultimate excellence should not admit of dispute. It is found easier by the short-sighted victims of disease to palliate their torments by medicine than to prevent them by regimen. The vulgar of all ranks are invariably sensual and indecile. Yet I cannot but feel myself persuaded that when the benefits of vegetable diet are mathematically proved, when it is as clear that those who live naturally are exempt from premature death, as that nine is not one, the most sottish of mankind will feel a preference towards a long and tranquil, contrasted with a short and painful life. On the average out of sixty persons, four die in three years. In April 1814 a statement will be given that sixty persons, all having lived more than three years on vegetables and pure water, are then in perfect health. More than two years have now elapsed, not one of them has died. No such example will be found in any sixty persons taken at random. Seventeen persons of all ages, the families of Dr. Lamb and Mr. Newton, have lived for seven years on this diet without a death, and almost without the slightest illness. Surely, when we consider that some of these were infants, and one a martyr to asthma, now nearly subdued, we may challenge any seventeen persons taken at random in this city to exhibit a parallel case. Those who may have been excited to question the rectitude of established habits of diet, by these loose remarks, should consult Mr. Newton's luminous and eloquent essay. It is from that book and from the conversation of its excellent and enlightened author that I have derived the materials which I here present to the public. When these proofs come fairly before the world, and are clearly seen by all who understand arithmetic, it is scarcely possible that abstinence from ailments demonstrably pernicious should not become universal. In proportion to the number of proselytes, so will be the weight of evidence, and when a thousand persons can be produced, living on vegetables and distilled water, who have to dread no disease but old age, the world will be compelled to regard animal flesh and fermented liquors as slow but certain poison. The change which would be produced by simpler habits on a political economy is sufficiently remarkable. The monopolizing eater of animal flesh would no longer destroy his constitution by devouring an acre at a meal, and many loaves of bread would cease to contribute to gout, madness, and apoplexy, in the shape of a pint of porter or a dram of gin, when appeasing the long protracted famine of the hard-working peasants' hungry babes. The quantity of nutritious vegetable matter consumed in fattening the carcass of an ox would afford ten times the sustenance, undepraving indeed, and incapable of generating disease if gathered immediately from the bosom of the earth. The most fertile districts of the habitable globe are now actually cultivated by men for animals, at a delay and waste of aliment absolutely incapable of calculation. It is only the wealthy that can, to any great degree, even now, indulge the unnatural craving for dead flesh, and they pay for the greater license of the privilege, by subjection to supernumerary diseases. Again the spirit of the nation that should take the lead in this great reform would insensibly become agricultural. Commerce, with all its vice, selfishness, and corruption, would gradually decline. More natural habits would produce gentler manners, and the excessive complication of political relations would be so far simplified that every individual might feel and understand why he loved his country and took a personal interest in its welfare. How would England, for example, depend on the caprices of foreign rulers if she contained within herself all the necessaries and despised whatever they possessed of the luxuries of life. How could they starve her into compliance with their views? Of what consequence would it be that they refused to take her woolen manufactures, when large and fertile tracts of the island ceased to be allotted to the waste of pasturage? On a natural system of diet, we should require no spices from India, 
no wines from portugal spain france or madeira none of those multitudinous articles of luxury for which every corner of the globe is rifled and which are the causes of so much individual rivalship such calamitous and sanguinary national disputes in the history of modern times the avarice of commercial monopoly no less than the ambition of weak and wicked chiefs seems to have fomented the universal discord to have added stubbornness to the mistakes of cabinets and indocility to the infatuation of people let it ever be remembered that it is the direct influence of commerce to make the interval between the richest and the poorest man wider and more unconquerable let it be remembered that it is a foe to everything of real worth and excellence in the human character the odious and disgusting aristocracy of wealth is built upon the ruins of all that is good in chivalry or republicanism and luxury is the forerunner of a barbarism scarce capable of cure it is impossible to realize a state of society where all the energies of man shall be directed to the reduction of his solid happiness certainly if this advantage the object of all political speculation be in any degree attainable it is attainable only by a community which holds out no factitious incentives to the avarice and ambition of the few and which is internally organized for the liberty security and comfort of many none must be entrusted with power and money is the completest species of power who do not stand pledged to use it exclusively for the general benefit but the use of animal flesh and fermented liquors directly militates with this equality of the rights of man the peasant cannot gratify these fashionable cravings without leaving his family to starve without disease and war those sweeping curtailers of population pasturage would include a waste too great to be afforded the labor requisite to support a family is far lighter than is usually supposed the peasantry work not only for themselves but for the aristocracy the army and the manufacturers the advantage of a reform in diet is obviously greater than that of any other it strikes at the root of the evil to remedy the abuses of legislation before we annihilate the propensities by which they are produced is to suppose that by taking away the effect the cause will cease to operate but the efficacy of this system depends entirely on the proselytism of individuals and grounds its merits as a benefit to the community upon the total change of the dietetic habits in its members it proceeds securely from a number of particular cases to one that is universal and has this advantage over the contrary mode that one era does not invalidate all that has gone before let not too much however be expected from this system the healthiest among us is not exempt from hereditary disease the most symmetrical athletic and long-lived is a being inexpressibly inferior to what he would have been had not the unnatural habits of his ancestors accumulated for him a certain portion of malady and deformity in the most perfect specimen of civilized man something is still found wanting by the physiological critic can a return to nature then instantaneously eradicate predispositions that have been slowly taking root in the silence of innumerable ages indubitably not all that i contend for is that from the moment of the relinquishing all unnatural habits no new disease is generated and that the predisposition to hereditary maladies gradually perishes for want of its accustomed supply in cases of consumption cancer gout asthma and scrofula such as the invariable tendency of a diet of vegetable and pure water those who may be induced by these remarks to give the vegetable system a fair trial should in the first place date the commencement of their practice from the moment of their conviction all depends upon the breaking through a pernicious habit resolutely and at once dr trotta asserts that no drunkard was ever reformed by gradually relinquishing his dram animal flesh in its effects on the human stomach is analogous to a dram it is similar in the kind though differing in the degree of its operation the proselyte to a pure diet must be warned to expect a temporary diminution of muscular strength the subtraction of a powerful stimulus will suffice to account for this event but it is only temporary and is succeeded by an equable capability for exertion far surpassing his former various and fluctuating strength above all he will acquire an easiness of breathing by which the same exertion is performed with a remarkable exemption from that painful and difficult panting now felt by almost every one after hastily climbing an ordinary mountain he will be equally capable of bodily exertion or mental application after as before his simple meal he will feel none of the narcotic effects of ordinary diet irritability the direct consequence of exhausting stimuli would yield to the power of natural and tranquil impulses 
he will no longer pine under the lethargy of ennui that unconquerable weariness of life more dreaded than death itself he will escape the epidemic madness that broods over its own injurious notions of the deity and realizes the hell that priests in bedlam's feign every man forms as it were his god from his own character to the divinity of one of simple habits no offering would be more acceptable than the happiness of his creatures he would be incapable of hating or persecuting others for the love of god he will find moreover a system of simple diet to be a system of perfect epicurism he will no longer be incessantly occupied in blunting and destroying those organs from which he expects his gratification the pleasures of taste to be derived from a dinner of potatoes beans peas turnips lettuces with a dessert of apples gooseberries strawberries currants raspberries and in winter oranges apples and pears is far greater than is supposed those who wait until they can eat this plain fare with the sauce of appetite will scarcely join with the hypocritical sensualist at a lord mayor's feast who declaims against the pleasures of the table solomon kept a thousand concubines and owned in despair that all was vanity the man whose happiness is constituted by the society of one amiable woman would find some difficulty in sympathizing with the disappointment of this venerable debauchee i address myself not only to the young enthusiast the ardent devotee of truth and virtue the pure and passionate moralist yet unvitiated by the contagion of the world he will embrace a pure system from its abstract truth its beauty its simplicity and its promise of wide extended benefit unless custom has turned poison into food he will hate the brutal pleasures of the chase by instinct it will be a contemplation full of horror and disappointment to his mind that beings capable of the gentlest and most admirable sympathies should take delight in the death pangs and last convulsions of dying animals the elderly man whose youth has been poisoned by intemperance or who has lived with apparent moderation and is afflicted with a variety of painful maladies would find his account in a beneficial change produced without the risk of poisonous medicines the mother to whom the perpetual restlessness of disease and unaccountable deaths incident to her children are the causes of incurable unhappiness would on this diet experience the satisfaction of beholding their perpetual health and natural playfulness the most valuable lives are daily destroyed by diseases that it is dangerous to palliate and impossible to cure by medicine how much longer will man continue to pimp for the gluttony of death his most insidious implacable and eternal foe the proselyte to a simple and natural diet who desires health must from the moment of his conversion attend to these rules never take any substance into the stomach that once had life drink no liquid but water restored to its original purity by distillation appendix persons on vegetable diet have been remarkable for longevity the first christians practised abstinence from animal flesh on a principle of self-mortification other instances are old pa one hundred and fifty two mary patton one hundred and thirty six a shepherd in hungary one hundred and twenty six patrick o'neill one hundred and thirteen joseph elkins one hundred and three elizabeth deval one hundred and one Aurangzebe, one hundred, Saint Anthony, one hundred and five, James the Hermit, one hundred and four, Arsenius, one hundred and twenty, Saint Epiphanius, one hundred and fifteen, Simeon, one hundred and twelve, and Rombold, one hundred and twenty. Mr. Newton's mode of reasoning on longevity is ingenious and conclusive. Old Parr, healthy as the wild animals, attained to the age of one hundred and fifty two years all men might be as healthy as the wild animals therefore all men might attain to the age of one hundred and fifty two years the conclusion is sufficiently modest old parr cannot be supposed to have escaped the inheritance of disease amassed by the unnatural habits of his ancestors the term of human life may be expected to be infinitely greater taking into the consideration all the circumstances that must have contributed to abridge even that of parr it may be here remarked that the author and his wife have lived on vegetables for eight months the improvements of health and temper here stated is the result of his own experience end of a vindication of natural diet by percy bysshe shelley